about this task force which has been established presently by the institute uh, the seven member ca team uh, to identify the issues in the income tax portal oh. although oh. although we were part of that task force but i am uh, <laughs> sorry to say this ki uh, nothing seems to be moving every day from our all the seven members across the country we mm. are raising at least uh, 10 issues per member so 100 issues been generated to and being escalated to cbdt as well as through cbdt to infosys also but uh, solutions uh, resolution is very very low very very low right right so no, this does these do happen you know i think they are probably caught into uh, this major issue in respect of managing the issues which are happening there right sir let's hope that it gets settled because i think it is the intentions are very good and i i in fact i appreciated the efforts which are put in and anything which is done which is so large and so huge there are bound to be some initial teething issues correct yeah so we'll start in 5 minutes i think uh, anup ji if it's okay because today's session is at 4:30 compared to other sessions of 5:30 we have just reminded all the participants that it starts at 4:30 so people are just joining in so maybe we right. can just start in 3 4 minutes sir. what i see you are already live on youtube also so some of the people might have come on the youtube it looks like right no, no, it see. is is on a private mode youtube okay acha okay. it's in a private mode okay there also okay but normally vivek ji we should start the program on time but today the participants so far joined very low because uh, our usually our workshop is started from 5:30 only on other days monday to thursday right. today right. tomorrow ah uh, today and tomorrow we will be starting from 4:30 so perhaps there may be some communication uh, i do not know no no we have communicated to the insert in the whatsapp group etc so probably you know people are just joining in uh, i think within 3 4 minutes i think uh, most of the time would come plus mail mails has also been suited from aci secretary right, has right. sent the mails also to all the members So Vivek ji, what I understand that I'll I'll be speaking for about two hours from four thirty onwards, so up right. to five thirty, or so up to about six thirty, and from six thirty, I think someone is going to take over for the stamp duty uh, aspects. For the stamp duty aspects, yeah. Okay. That's uh, Vivek ji. Hmm. Vivek ji, what I was saying is since participants is already aware about the ACA, so hmm. my welcoming, I should start the welcoming part. so the sir will get the net content time of at least 2 hours to deliberate upon so the uh, so the delegates will definitely be benefited and sir will also be get brushed up about the aca what is the new, new developments in aca and all sure so, sure please uh, ajay ji is also joining ha huh? uh, second speaker ajay ji has also joined okay okay that's great that's great so uh, Vivek ji, can I may I start? Yes, yes, yes. Please, Anup ji, please, please okay. let us start. Uh, friends, very good evening to all of you. On behalf of Association of Corporate Advisors and Executives, which is the oldest professional body in Kolkata, which was established in the year nineteen sixteen, I am C. A. Anup Sanghai, currently the president of A. C. A. E. welcomes you all to the delegates on six day workshop today is the fifth day uh, friday of this workshop on business restructuring which was started from monday i also welcome our guest speaker of the day ca milin mehta sir from vadodara uh, i believe mr nimit uh, nirmit mehta and ms tanjana sah will also be joining uh, vivek ji yeah they have already joined okay so i also welcome mr nirmit mehta and uh, ms tanjana sah and our uh, advocate Uh, ajay choudhury ji from kolkata who has kindly consented to be our guest speakers for today's session friends the workshop topics were chosen uh, in a very apt way so this that will be actually contemporary topics and will be relevant for all our delegates and participants uh, as far as aca is concerned about the aca our members have a diverse prof uh, profile which include professional practitioners corporate executives industrialists and businessmen the membership strength is little more than 1350 uh, we became a premier institution of excellence and learning in the field of accounting taxation legal corporate matters and finance 
uh, ACA has been organizing conferences, symposia, seminars, workshops, group discussions, lecture meetings, memorial lectures, debates, and panel discussion on a regular basis to keep our members updated on all the issues of uh, professional interest. We also provide a pl platform to many young talents for making their deliberations on various issues of economic interest and thus grooming future intellectuals and professionals in the society. Our uh, USP on this particular area is group discussions where, where we normally uh, have these young talents for their future grooming up. Our programs have so far been addressed by late Jayaprakash Narayan, who is a political visionary, let Sri Somna Chatterjee, a statesman and former speaker of Lok Sabha, Bharat Ratna, let Sri Pranam Mukherjee, who was former president of India, Sri K. Sri Nath Tripathi, uh, Dr. Arvind Panigriya, Dr. Amit Mitra, Sri YC Deveswar, Mr. B.M. Khaitan, Mr. R.S. Agrawal, Sanjeev Goenka, Harshwadhan Nevatiya, T.V. Mohandas Pai, etc. Uh, ACA has initiated and established the first annual corporate awards in West Bengal in association with Economic Times, which is popularly known as ET Bengal Corporate Awards, which has recognized the achievement of corporate Bengal for the past seven years. This is brief about ACA. Our state-of-the-art office infrastructure, which is in the heart of the city, was inaugurated in the July uh, 2011 by Dr. Amit Mitra. And we have recently acquired a new office in the same building for the benefit of our members and students and which will be operated in this operational within this month itself. So with this brief introduction about ACI, I am handing over the proceedings to our chairman, multidisciplinary, multi uh, and allied law committee, CA Vivek Navatiya. Over to CA Vivek Navatiya ji. Thank you, Anup ji. Uh, Mayur, uh, could you welcome the faculty members uh, who, uh, and introduce them uh, formally? So uh, uh, and then we can, uh, into, I can then introduce the topic. Sure, sure, Vivek ji. I one by one introduce both the speakers. Uh, first of all, Milan Mehta, sir. Milan Mehta leads the practice of the firm since last three decades. During his lead, uh, leadership, he has uh, turned the firm to grow geographically as well as expanding the scope of its services. Besides being a chartered accountant, he is also a law graduate. His multifaceted and uh, meritorious academics and experience gives him opportunity to serve clients in the areas ranging from accounting to tax, valuations to strategies, and governance to law. Milan presently focuses on the transaction advisory services of the firm, which also provides technical leadership to the tax practice. He is member of the, uh, he is member of the committee appointed by the Finance Ministry for formulation of ICDS, as well as MAT computations under India's scenario. Milan has an excellent network he also serves as independent director in various listed and unlisted companies and chairs their audit committees. He is a prolific speaker and has uh, presented papers and delivered talks in seminar at national level. We welcome you, Milan, sir, to ACA. Uh, our second speaker of the day, uh, Ajay ji, is also with us. Advocate Ajay Chaudhary specializes in corporate, civil, and arbitration law and has been involved in complex litigations and corporate transactions spanning a whole gamut of corporate, civil, and arbitration law. Over a period of time, he has developed affinity towards property, criminal and uh, testimon uh, testamentary laws of the land and have developed a practice interest in these legal arenas as well. He appears regularly in uh, various courts, including the Supreme Court of India, NCLT, NCLT, DRT, and all other judicial forums, including conducting arbitrations across the length of the of the country. He branched out and uh, founded Chaudhary Laws, Chaudhary's Law Offices in October 2011 in Kolkata. And in a short span, the firm has rapidly grown from a small startup to becoming a leading provider of legal services in this area. We welcome you, Advocate Ajay Chaudhary ji, to the ACE Forum. Over to the chairman. Thank you, Mayur, for the introduction. Uh, we welcome Mr. Mehta uh, to speak on uh, the topic amalgamation and demerger, transfer of business, including slump sales, slump exchange, and itemized sale. Any business restructuring topic workshop will be incomplete without these topics. I think over the last four days, the sessions which we had, we had all discussed about amalgamation, demerger, and there was some flavor of these uh, issues when we discussed about other aspects of restructuring. So, uh, so this topic, when we talk about amalgamation and demerger, is something which is very, very fundamental to any business restructuring. And when we look at how the Finance Act, Income Tax Act has evolved, evolved over a period, I, we see a number of 
restructuring in respect of amalgamation and demerger which are happening over a period and the activity has significantly increased over the last few years we have seen uh, amendments in the income tax finance act 2021 wherein slump exchange has been brought to tax uh, there is all there was always an ambiguity as to whether slump exchange was taxable prior to the amendment there have been courts which have ruled in favor of the ssc and with a clarificatory amendment now probably slump exchange is uh, uh, taxable under the purview of section 50b coming to amalgamation and demerger there have been uh, various structures now devised by sscs wherein uh, companies are now issuing preference shares optionally convertible preference shares redeemable preference shares to what extent would the structure test the eyes of law whether this would fall within the purview of gar or not these are questions which would uh, probably uh, let the jurisprudence decide also when we look at the definition of amalgamation demerger these definitions are there since time immemorial uh, we have been looking reading through the, these definitions for so many years but still there are have been litigations when it comes to how would the shareholders holding not less than 3/4 be counted how would if there would be certain companies which are having cross holding and that gets merged with another company how would the 3/4 test be satisfied whether the 3/4 test be satisfied because the number of the shares get extinguished and the cancelled when the companies merged with another amalgamated company the question, the concept of resulting company is also a question the the concept of undertaking whether a company which has not started its business whether the it has just invested in certain assets and there's no income started whether that would meet the definition of undertaking are questions which have always vexed us as professionals there are many issues when it comes to uh, this, when we discuss some uh, issues relating to amalgamation demerger and slumsy to take uh, us through these topics we have mr mehta with us and he, uh, and uh, we would Uh, we and the participants would be i think uh, would be wonderfully enriched with his experience and the case studies which he would deal with and there would be a wonderful experience for us uh, we welcome mr mehta to uh, start the session and uh, mr mehta the dais is all yours yeah uh, thank you uh, thank you vivek ji thank you anup ji and thank you mayur ji for the purpose of uh, introduction many times you know the purpose of accepting an invitation is to ensure that you know people say good words about you and you know that's the only reassurance that you have and this also proves a similar type of situation and uh, i was just reminded by anup ji and vivek ji both that this is my second uh, attempt when it comes to aca earlier i was there and i was speaking on penny stock uh, some several years ago and i am reminded of a, of words of a very very dear friend of course very old and no, now no longer no more there mr jal dastur so when mr jal dastur was invited to baroda for the first time a second time you know for giving a lecture and he said it is a victory of hope over experience and uh, we were just scratching our head and then we realized that what he is talking about is that your experience was not good earlier but there was a hope that this man would at least deliver good this time so i think the same thing i can repeat for myself that it's a victory of hope over experience uh, and uh, thank you very much for that and it is the hope in these times that keeps us alive and uh, i am very grateful to acae for giving me one more opportunity to uh, share my thoughts with respect with all with all of you uh, friends uh, when uh, vivek ji was mentioning it almost looked like you know uh, if he had spoken for a few more minutes uh, what would have happened is i would have possibly not given my lecture because i think he was almost uh, i think he had an inside information about what i'm going to talk about it looked like so but uh, i think it's very very relevant points which he has taken what i've done is uh, i'll just share my screen uh, uh, multiple bar so i will just share my screen yeah No, one second. Very good. Okay. Uh, you can see my screen now. Yes, sir. Yeah, I'll just share. Yeah. So, uh, what I've done is I've done a couple of things, couple of uh, slide. I have started with uh, what are the precautions which are required to be taken? Why the merger is why merger, demerger, uh, restructuring, etc. is required. and thereafter gone into what are the important aspects to be taken into consideration uh, and uh, what is the way in which the law is developing now this when i go to it is not only applicable to the 
mergers like uh, mergers and uh, uh, mergers and demergers etc but in respect of all the transactions that we do in respect of uh, various things so i would be going into that particular aspect and then after giving a brief because you already have lot of uh, uh, sessions in respect of mergers mergers and acquisitions and demergers restructuring etc i will really briefly touch upon the provisions and then go into some of the important important aspects and some of the things that we have faced and how it can be utilized because it is not purely legal that we need to talk about we need to also see from a strategic because it is not it is it is it is an organization of corporate professionals also so when we talk about corporate professionals it's not only the legal aspect it is important but also the strategic aspects of mergers the mergers etc which could be very important and how we can utilize this for the purpose of meeting our business objectives which are there in respect of this one. so i will go into this aspect now the first question which would arise is why why the whole thing of merger acquisitions spin offs slum sale etc is required what are the reasons why it is there i just listed down and i'm sure that you know whenever we do about any of such thing we should always talk about that what are the what are the reasons why it would happen why would you want to do it and i'll give you examples of each one of them to the extent you know i can remember those which are the real life examples where it can happen now expanding businesses you know one of the reasons why we would do either a merger or an acquisition is uh, is for the purpose of ensuring that there is either an expansion of a business or you acquire some sort of a brand uh, which is another brand and where you acquire either by way of a demerger you will acquire or by by way of a uh, acquisition that you will acquire or business purchase etc you will acquire a business along with a brand uh when you want to access the new markets you know in that situation also this could be a, a acquisition which could which could take place uh there could be the primary you know the either the merger would be either on account of a strategic alliance with another entity or it could be purely for the purpose of an internal restructuring that you might want to do you would have multiple entities within your organizations which would want to merge into a single entity or you might have a single entity which would have a multiple business which would want to keep it as a separate entities for the purpose of ensuring so these are the aspects which can happen in respect of that in case of internal structuring also could be for several reasons you can have a focused attention to the business where say for example there is now one of the cases where we were doing that there was a company which had a very large profitability and there was another business which was a large volume but low profitability business now what used to happen that every time that the same management was looking at both the businesses the low low volume business though of course it was producing more profits and more income it was bringing in since it was a low margin business it was always looked down upon whereas the other business which was more fashionable bringing lesser profits but higher percentage of profit it was always looked up on and this was demoralizing the team so what we decided that it's better idea that we separate this businesses into two entities so that there is a focus which can be done just to give you an example you know how the value creation can happen in case of a demerger when on account of an internal restructuring and one of the cases which i still remember is alembic and alembic alembic limited which was a single company wherein an alembic pharma was demerged into a separate entity and now you can see the value which is created on account of this top type of a separation wherein a complete focus attention was given to the pharma business and that is how it's a it's a study to be uh, done by someone to see uh just to give you from a share per share price perspective was alembic limited's original price of all the combined business was about 70 rupees a share and after demerger uh you know there was about a 30% creation of additional shares for account of that because 30% additional shares were created which was held back now the combined now if you look at it alembic limited which is the old company the share price is at about 100 rupees a share and alembic pharma is about 1000 rupees plus i about now about 700 rupees a huge amount of value which was created in respect of these on account of because there was a focus attention which was given to the business similarly in case if there are synergies of a similar business which is happening in respect of that then in that situation you can you if you merge these businesses into a single entity it may be possible for you to it, it would be more appropriate for you to merge so that you can have a common management for the purpose of ensuring and then duplication of effort duplicate duplicate mds duplicate cfo duplicate uh, marketing department etc can be avoided and a, uh, and a more more i would say uh, synergized business can be carried out in case if they are merged in respect of that similarly aligning objectives conflict of interest situation now we are at present you know we are working on a proposal and a case 
where there is a global level merger which is being planned. And when there was a global level merger, in India, there are going to be two entities. One is a listed entity, another is an unlisted entity. Both are in the similar business. Now, how do I ensure that there is no conflict of interest situation which arise when there is a listed company in the same business competing in the same market and there is an unlisted company which is in the same market and doing the same business? Now, how would you ensure that listed companies, you have a partner and in case of an unlisted company, you don't have a partner. Partner in the form of a pa partner in the form of a public, whereas in other company, you don't have any partner. How do you ensure? In such a situation, it may be a good idea to see in case if we can do the merger of these two entities and then ensure that there is a listed entity, which is a single entity where the part public also participates. There are cap capital restructuring. You know, honestly speaking, there are cases where intercompany holdings are there and intercompany holdings because of the tax structures that we have, it would become, it could become very, very uh, uh, tax uh, it could become very, very unproductive from a tax perspective. It could become very unproductive from the point of view of control, et cetera. Uh, even the valuation could be lost because the company, which is a subsidiary, the holding company may not carry the same value which it would have. In such a situation also, it may be a good idea to do the merger or it may be important for the purpose of doing it. Even from a pure tax perspective also, sometimes the merger works. Uh, I will come to that in case if you do it from, from purely tax perspective. Uh, what would what would happen in respect of this part? But I think it is important. Similarly, in case of boarding of competitions, you know, you know of a case where acquisitions used to take place. Gillette used to go on acquiring all blade manufacturing company, so it acquired and completely nullified the entire competition which was there in the market. And now you know the way in which the Gillette is operating in India. It's like blade business is completely Gillette controlled, and that's what is the strategy that they did in respect of boarding off of the competition. Similarly, in case of getting access to the licenses or pre-qualification. Just to give you an example, you know, the merger in respect of happened where uh, I think, as I understand, uh, Kingfisher acquired uh, one of the airlines, Deccan. Now, the reason was that Kingfisher wanted to start international operations. Now, international operations, the pre-qualification was that you must be existing for at least a period of three to five years. Kingfisher was a newly started entity and it did not have that qualification. But in case it be acquired, uh, it acquired uh, Deccan. In that situation, it would have, because Deccan was existing for a more period. And that's how it acquired uh, Deccan. And that's the reason why it could start the process of you know, doing the international operation. So even those type of reasons why there could be a merger or an acquisition, it can take place in this spectrum. We have used sometimes the uh, process of mergers or process of demergers for the purpose of giving an exit to one of the groups by using the liquidity of the entity itself. Now, what can happen is that there is a liquidity in the company and one of the groups wants to exit. Now, if one of the group wants to exit, not every time that you can do it by way of a buyback shares, because in India, targeted buybacks are not permitted. It is the permission is only done with respect to non, you know, you have to give a general buyback offers. Uh, so not every time you can use this. Uh, but you can always do a demerger of the businesses and thereafter the exits can be given in respect of this part. Otherwise, you will have to declare dividends. Dividends would go to both the entities. Thereafter, one entity would use the cash for the purpose of acquiring the shares of another entity, which is fairly un un uh, uh, unworthy from the tax perspective. But you can, in case if you can use a demerger or you can use a merger as a process, which can be done in such a smart way that you are able to uh, uh, ensure that you know that there is a uh, there is a complete uh, uh, exit which happens of one of the groups by using the liquidity of the group itself. Uh, there are tax considerations, especially in case of inter internal mergers. There are times where there is a loss making company, there is a profit making company. If you do the merger in that situation, there is a timing value of the tax because you can save the tax today. You don't have to pay the tax in case of profit making company. There are cases where you can structure the transactions in such a manner earlier than used to be because of the goodwill. People used to do the merger where the goodwill could be created and you could claim the depreciation in respect of that part. So these are the aspects which can happen in respect of uh, uh, the mergers where you can even internal mergers from a tax perspective, you can use it for a significant reason. Uh, the departures and spin-offs where the businesses have different growth paths where the investor, like for example, in case of a spin-off, you know, you have two businesses, some strategic investor or a private equity investor comes and wants to invest only one part of the business. 
in such a situation either you can do a demerger of that entity or you can do a demerger of the or you can do a spin off of that into a wholly owned subsidiary or to some other entity and thereafter the investor can come and make an investment only in that entity in that situation it is possible for you to have a focused investments in respect of that even the employees you know you want to give an employee a remuneration plan or you want to give an employee stock options only with respect to one of the groups in that situation also if it is demerged into a separate entity you may be able to do it in a much better manner uh, where the strategic investment is expected in one of the businesses several businesses where also the demerger or spin offs could be very useful where you want to ring fence say for example some businesses have become very risky business it is likely to get into some sort of a trouble over a period of time there are variations which are happening in respect of margins and there are huge liabilities in that situation it could be a good idea to ring fence some of the businesses which can be taken out of these operations and kept into a separate entity and that is the reason why the risk which is expected to risky business would continue to remain only in one of the businesses whereas the profitable business can still continue its operations while the other businesses can go into some sort of a trouble uh, it is not for the purpose of defrauding the collection but at least protecting the business which is run in a proper manner so that you can create investor value you can create and protect the uh, businesses which are which can still continue because if the whole thing goes into nclt you know a good business also can get into a trouble and a bad business in any case is in trouble but if you separate it out in that situation it is possible for you to protect at least those businesses uh, there are listed and unlisted entities say for example there is a listed entity wherein you want to convert some of the part of the business into an unlisted entity then whether you can demerge a, list, uh, a listed company's business into an unlisted company that is also something which is which has been done in some of the past cases and this can be done and there also the demerger could be used as a process similarly which i mentioned about exit of one of the groups it can be also done by way of a demerger or a spin off wherein the consideration for the spin off could be given by way of a convertible preference shares a non -convert, optionally convertible preference shares and when you give an optionally convertible preference shares the group which wants to exit would not exercise his option there is a group which wants to continue with exercise its option and that's also the way in which you can use and then the shares are redeemed in respect of those portions so these are the interesting things which you can do in respect of ensuring that the uh, the, uh, the exits do take place uh now friends i think we we must whenever why i went into all these strategic reasons that if you do not have any of such reasons you if you do a demerger or a you do a merger primarily with an intention to save the taxes or to uh, make it more tax efficient etc in that situation there are chances that you know you may get caught into the ndfus regulations i will therefore take you through some of the provisions which are related to ndfus provisions and whenever i have suggested you know in the in the future whenever you go into my presentations and when i speak you must always keep these things in mind that everything will have to be read in context of the nt of these provisions regulations that we have and in case of nt reviews let's look at the way in which even before the we had the provisions in respect of general nt avoidance regulations gar provisions which had come up and at that point in time we had already uh, got the provisions and courts had given some sort of a view in case of mcdowell that you are all aware uh for the reasons you know mcdowell you are i'm sure that you are aware but here we are talking about for the reasons that is in the because of the supreme court decisions so in case of supreme court they have already said that tax planning may not be may, may be legitimate provided it's within the framework of law but they had frowned upon the gar tax planning provisions and say that anything which is done for the purpose of it's it's it, it would consider to be a, a transaction which are without honesty and therefore Uh, uh it was frowned upon and rejected the tax planning schemes which are done in respect of that so i think the tax planning was not looked down upon very favorably by the tribunal and as you are all aware who are in the tax practice the income tax department using started using left right and center for everything and i always used to say that when the tax department used two decisions which were very famous one was sumati dayal and second one was metta so the moment they start using either sumati dayal or mcdowell we know it for certain that they have no case because only when they did not have any case they went into this decisions which are too general and too broad wherein they used to pick up some sentences from this decisions and started using or abusing against the taxpayers so mcdowell was such decision wherein they already mentioned that 
any anything which is done for the purpose of avoiding tax will not be acceptable to the courts. However, thereafter we had, and you know, in case the decisions which were in favor of the proposition that anything which is within the four corners of law, uh, it is it is not something which is incorrect, and therefore you cannot just uh, uh, reject such transactions. And these are the the first one was Duke of Duke of Westminster's, but that was pre McDowell. And McDowell actually, in a way, said and distinguished itself in respect of you, uh, in respect of itself. But the real push which came to the tax planning was by way of an Azadi Bachao Andolan decision, which was in 2003, wherein Supreme Court upheld the treaty. And he said that, look, you know, you just cannot every time that there is a treaty provision, you cannot say that treaty shopping unless it is part of the part of the uh, anti-abuse provisions of a treaty, you cannot. Uh, import such type of things into the provision and you will have to so azari bachao almost gave validity to a tax planning tool so long as it is not an anti abuse or it is not evasion in respect of taxes vodafone went one step further and it also said that look through and look at approach in respect of this aspect and said that look the government has to look at the transaction and not look through the transaction though the substance over form is important but it is not a look at the transaction, which is important in respect of that. And therefore, every planning or every, every structure which results into tax avoidance or tax reduction cannot be, uh, cannot be rejected only on the ground that it has no other purpose. Right? So that's what the, the Vodafone uh, possibly uh, looked at. And we have thereafter, we had present situation. And then, as I call it, you know, we have BC and AD, which is before Christ, Christ and after death, as I used to, I, because I don't, I, I don't understand and can't know about the, uh, uh, about the Roman words, but I always used to say before Christ, Christ and after death, which is BC and AD. Now we have got BG and AG, and which is before Gar and after Gar provisions. And therefore now everything, and as you are aware, that GAR is an extremely wide provision and it gives wide powers. So of course the authorities have been vested with a very high and senior level committee, but they are, there are there are extremely wide powers which are required. And it says, and you know, if you say that there are one thing which has been achieved by way of 10 steps, then every step has to have commercial visa. Even if one step does not have a commercial reason, they can restructure, reframe, recharacterize that structure, that step, and do it. So, for example, to just give you an example, we used to do always a demerger and thereafter conversion into an LE. Now, both the transactions are supported by the of their special anti-abuse regulations, and therefore they are covered by those provisions. But if you look the both the both the steps together. In that situation, there is a possibility that they might say that, okay, both the steps have been taken for the purpose of avoiding taxes, so individual steps are okay. But since you have done one step after the other in quick succession, that falls within the uh, rigors of GAR provisions. So the fundamentals of GAR is that the main object of either the transaction or every step in that transaction should not be that of a tax avoidance. Any any about any event prior to 1 for 2017 are grandfathered and they cannot be disturbed now. It's not applicable if the tax benefit is less than rupees three crores, and that has to be seen collectively for all the persons for all the years together. And onus is on the SSE. The real purpose in section 96 2 says that in case there is a tax saving if, uh, in a transaction, the only thing with the department has to prove that there is a tax saving. Once the tax saving is done, the owner shifts to the SSE and SSE has to prove that the main purpose is not that of the tax avoidance. And very wide powers have been given in case if it is done. I'm not going into the definitions of that, but everything that you do will have to be now looked upon from a GAR perspective. Now, every conference that I do in respect of any structure planning or any restructuring proposals that we do, they, the councils, the first thing it comes if you check it from a GAR perspective, is there a commercial substance in respect of that? So what is most important is that tax benefit is incidental. If it is incidental, tax benefit is not found upon. What is important that that should not be the main purpose. Main objective should be either some commercial reasons, legal reasons, or some sort of an economic reasons why a structure has been proposed. Once it satisfies that test, now that results into something of a, which is a, which is, uh, which is uh, beneficial to you from a tax angle, 
I think that is not a problem, but it has to pass the test of, as we call it, that the principal objective should be something. So if you are proposing, so let's take a situation that if you are proposing a merger of a company with a completely shell company or a company which is a merger into another entity, which is but no business is at all. In that situation, the natural question which would arise is why are you merging into that entity? There is absolutely no purpose for merging because that company does not, it's not a merger at all. There is no reason why a company which is an existing company which is running should merge into an entity which does not have any business. Mergers are supposed to be amalgamation of two businesses, the companies which have got assets, etc. So you must create some economic value into another entity. And once you have created economic value into another entity, then only you should create and do the merger so that it passes the test of commercial substance in respect of merger. However, demerger into a completely new entity is fine because you can always demerge it because there are the purpose of the entity demerger is to ensure that you are able to uh, separate that business into a new entity. But merger of these two entities could be a matter of question which can arise in respect of that. Uh, if you look at the other international provisions, international, and I think it is why I'm saying this, probably it may not be very relevant from a merger or a demerger perspective. But what is important for all of you and all of us to keep it in mind at the top, that globally, there is a significant uh, uh, pushback, which is happening in respect of smart tax planning methodologies. People do not look upon anyone who smartly saved the tax as a good, good measure and good corporate citizenry. And you look at the provisions which are happening. Now there is a multilateral instrument which has been signed where India is a signatory and it is applicable to a significantly large number of double tax avoidance agreements that we have. And as you now go to the income tax site and see, look at the most of the agreements, most of the agreement would have two, two agreements. One is the original agreement and second, second one, they call it as a synthesized, synthesized text, wherein because in case if the MLI is signed, and both the countries, TT countries, have notified with respect to the other country, the MLI provisions. In that situation, the this text of the uh, double tax avoidance is amended, keeping in mind the MLI provisions. So I think this is very important that we need to keep it in mind. And the primary purpose of MLI is to, to the, the most important thing is that where people used to take advantage so that there is a double on taxation which is happening, wherein a person is not taxed in the country of origin or source of the income, it is also not taxed in the source of country of uh, residence. Those type of things should be avoided and it should be ensured that there are the arrangement should not be done for obtaining the TT, TT benefit. One of the principal purpose in MLI is a principal purpose test that any sort of a, a treaty or any sort of an arrangement principal purpose or one of the principal purpose should not be obtaining the TT benefit. If that is the situation, so if you look at it, the TT taking tax advantage by way or as a principal purpose for setting up some entity, et cetera, there should not be any, any respect in respect of MLI provisions. There is a simplified li a limitation of benefit provisions, which also provides that in case if the beneficial owner of this entity, the person is not a resident of a country, in that situation, the rights to claim the benefit under a treaty are uh, significantly reduced in respect of that. Similarly, the preamble also provides that you, the treaty should not create an opportunity for the purpose of double non-taxation. Another important change which has happened in respect of taxation is the place of effective management, which is with respect to the international. The reason why I'm saying this is that this also has resulted into all the planning that we used to do and to create the structures for the purpose of holding companies which are investment outside India or investments which are within India through a foreign company. These are all things which are coming into picture in respect of that. Earlier, the law in respect of a foreign company being treated as a resident of India was very restricted. Unless those companies, the uh, effect, uh, entire control and management of that company is entirely situated in India, then only it was treated as a resident of India. Now, in this situation, under the say, now they have come into place of effective management. And that in case if the place of effective management is situated of that entity in India, not complete control, but even effective control is in India during the significant part of the year. In that situation, that entity would be treated as a resident of India and would be liable to tax in respect of all worldwide income in India. 
This is something which is very important that we need to keep it in mind. And the purpose of this is saying that in case if you see domestic law development, international law development, even if you see even the countries like EU nations, Mauritius, Singapore, UAE, all have started introducing anti-abuse provisions. Now, if you look at the limitation of benefit clauses which have been introduced, uh, there are provisions which are introduced in UAE where there is a significant economic presence is required to be proved in respect of that country or economic presence is required for the purpose of justifying the income which you earned in UAE. Now the law says this wise in UAE that in case if you have an income in UAE, if you do not have significant or you do not have substantive economic presence in that entity, justifying that income in that situation, the UAE authority may communicate with the countries to which this income should actually belong to. And this can raise a significant issues in respect of that. Similarly, LOB benefits have been introduced in even in the treaty like Mauritius, Singapore, et cetera. Uh, the ultimate, ultimate beneficial ownership provisions which are there already in the treaty. And now there is also a requirement for the purpose of ensuring that these provisions would also be uh, referred to like in case of a dividend, in case if you want to take a concessional rate of dividend benefit of a treaty, the ultimate BO, uh, uh, beneficial owner are also required to be taken into consideration. So friends, these all provisions therefore lead to a conclusion that whenever you are planning for a structure, any restructuring exercise that you do, the first and the foremost thing that you should apply, and in this triangle, if you see, which is the reverse triangle, uh, well, which you see, that the first and the foremost foundation for anything is the commercial justification of a restructuring exercise. And it has to first fit into commercial. Once it fits into commercial, then it has to fit into the legal requirement. And we have a complex law in respect of that. We have got Companies Act, we have got the LODR, we have got uh, issues in respect of uh, uh, delisting regulations, and we have got so many complex provisions. We have got FEMA, we have got uh, various laws which are applicable, competition laws. We need to see that we comply with all these provisions and carry out the planning in respect of that. The entire regulatory environment will have to be taken into consideration. And then the last thing is the tax. So now if you fulfill all these requirements, then the restructuring is advisable. So if the arrangement makes commercial or economic sense, then making it more tax efficient cannot be questioned. So now once you prove that merger is essential, now merger is A into B or B into A, that cannot be questioned. So long as you can prove that A and B merger is essential, then how you do the merger, that cannot be questioned by any entity. But if the merger itself is questioned, in that situation, no matter how compliant you make it, it would, it would probably have its own, it would not be able to meet the GAR requirements of that. This brings me now to the topic. So why I gave this Lumba lecture is for the purpose of ensuring that please do not get carried away by the planning which I might suggest in the subsequent slides or the options that might be created or it may come to your mind. Whenever that comes up, please go and refer to the provisions of TAR. Please see whether it makes economic substance, uh, it, whether it, require, it makes economic sense, whether it makes commercial sense. And are you able to justify the merger even without there being any tax benefit? If it satisfies those requirements, if you have a strong ground for the purpose of justifying something which you are doing in that situation only, you know, you can probably, you should try to move forward in respect of these provisions. A quick introduction of merger and what are the provisions of amalgamation, which is under section 21B. If you try to look at merger in the Income Tax Act, there is nothing like merger in the Income Tax Act. We have only got amalgamation, which is defined in the section 21B of ITA. Uh, and that it, it says that a merger qualifies to be a merger if it satisfies the three conditions that all the assets and liabilities of the amalgamating company must be transferred to the amalgamating company shareholders holding at least three fourths in the value of the shares become the shareholders of the amalgamated company. And for the purpose of calculation of this three fourths in the value, the shares which are already held by the amalgamated company will have to be ignored. And amalgamation must not be in the nature of business purchase or distribution of assets on liquidation. So this is, this is once it, it satisfies this condition, 
it satisfies to be an amalgamation in the section 21B. Now, merely because it is an amalgamation which is under section 21B, it does not automatically result into the exemption which is available to the employees, uh, to the persons. But if it is an amalgamation which qualifies under section 21B, in that situation, it becomes a tax neutral transaction under section 47. Uh, provided some small additional conditions have been provided in respect of amalgamation. But if it is an amalgamation, it, provide, it, it meets with the requirement in the company. Now, in case of an amalgamation, what happens? The transferor company transfers all its assets from it to the amalgamated company. So that's the first piece of transfer. Now, Section 47 says very clearly that that transfer is tax free and there is no need for having any, uh, there is no need for paying any tax by the amalgamated company. Similarly, the shareholders of the amalgamated company, amalgamating company, extinguish the right in respect of those shares and in exchange they're allotted shares of the amalgamated company. So if I've acquired shares for rupees, I had acquired shares at 10 rupees and I get in exchange at the time of merger, if I get shares for thousand rupees, then that 990 rupees theoretically can become taxable. Just to recall and uh, 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 to recount, there was a big debate which was there originally that whether an extinguishment of an asset would as constitute a transfer. And I'm sure that you would be aware about, uh, you would be reminded of the decision in case of Leo Machado and also in the case of Garden Silk, wherein they had said that the definition of section uh, transfer under section two subsection 47 included an item which is extinguishment of rights therein. Now extinguishment of rights therein did not include extinguishment of asset itself. Because when you are saying extinguishment of rights therein, it envisages that the asset must should remain in existence before and after transfer, only rights in such assets would get extinguished. So an extinguishment, so in case if the assets get destroyed, like say for example, a ship getting sunk or a factory getting burned down, this in this type of a situation, the asset itself extinguishes and if asset extinguishes and if I receive something in compensation, that would not amount to a transfer. And since it does not amount to a transfer, it would result into uh, no capital gains tax in my hands. A same I, I argument was done in case of Grace Collis, but in case of Grace Collis, the Bombay High Court decided that extinguishment of asset and following the decision in the case of uh, uh, following the uh, uh, decision in the case of uh, Leo Machado, etc., they had held that uh, an, on amalgamation, the shares of the amalgamating company gets extinguished, and when those shares get extinguished, there is there cannot be any capital gain because it does not fall within the so any new shares which I receive in extinguishment of original share cannot be considered to be a capital gain chargeable because there is no transfer. Uh, this decision was reversed by the Supreme Court saying that a transfer definition does include any extinguishment of an asset. And if you remember in case of Narkali Sarabhai, similar view was taken in case of the redemption of preference shares. And similarly, in case of Grace Collins, it was decided in case of amalgamation, a capital gain would arise to the person who receives this, but unless it satisfies the condition of section 47. So, Section 47, so long as I, I, I satisfy the terms and conditions of Section 21B read with Section 47 conditions, uh, my capital gain in the hands of the shareholder also would be accepted. Uh, the, so it becomes tax neutral. There are other natural corollary which happens and that is in respect of substitution of the cost of acquisition, substitution of the date of acquisition. These provisions would apply. My Section 242 essays that period of holding of the shares in the new company or the new shares would be the same, would start from the date on which I started holding the shares of the amalgamated company. So all those provisions would apply. My cost of acquisition would remain the same in case of a merger, et cetera. Uh, and similarly, the assets which are acquired by the amalgamating company, the date of acquisition, the written down value of the block of assets would continue to be the same as that of the earlier. So complete tax neutrality was provided or is provided in respect of a merger which happens, which satisfies the condition section 21B, read with whatever additional conditions in respect of different transfers which are given in section 47. Uh, similarly, uh, 
provisions of section 72a says that in case if there is a, uh, a merger which happens and it satisfies the condition of section 72a in that situation on account of merger this additional period is not correct so in case of a merger the i, I will be dealing with the period in respect of accumulated losses and depreciation the accumulated losses and depreciation of the amalgamating company becomes the accumulated losses and depreciation of the amalgamated company or on account of this merger and they are entitled to carry forward and set off against the profits of this entity uh, i will also deal with section 79 versus section 72a section 79 provides that in case if there is a change in the shareholding of a company beyond 50% uh, uh, in that situation uh, there could be there would be uh, uh, entire carry forward losses of that entity would be lost and it could not be entitled to carry forward and set off against the profits i will deal with that in in what circumstances a merger would result into that sort of a situation and what are the options which are available in respect of that uh, as you are all aware that there were always there was a decision in the case of smith security in case of smith security what happens uh, in case if the fair value of the assets of an entity which is getting amalgamated which a company acquires as a result of amalgamation if that fair value is say for example 100 crores of rupees but you have allotted shares the fair value of the assets which are so allotted shares which are allotted if it is coming out to be 150 crores of rupees then the 50 crores of rupees which you have given extra would be defined as goodwill in the books because that's the reason why you have given this and that goodwill which is so created smith security it says that it was allowed as depreciation or that was allowed as a deduction so smith security actually only dealt with that whether goodwill is entitled to depreciation or not and that goodwill was created on account of a merger and therefore lot of people started claiming deduction in respect of goodwill which was so created on account of merger there were there were products which were sold saying that i'll get you a goodwill deduction so a companies were merged into a uh, uh, to a company which had got a very low value and then you know huge number of shares were allotted and goodwill was created and goodwill depreciation was being claimed so this was marketed by a lot of professionals and i'm sure that you would have come across several in respect of that however with effect from 1st of april 2021 that is assessment year 21 22 an amendment has been made so as to completely deny the deduction in respect of goodwill including the goodwill which was created prior to 14 2020 so this is not available even for assessment year 21 22 so even for the financial year beginning or a previous year beginning from 1st of april 2020 ending on 2021 the depreciation on goodwill will not be allowed and in respect of any block of asset which contains the goodwill that could will have to be excluded for the purpose of calculating depreciation for assessment year 21 22 onwards so this is a change which has happened in respect of that otherwise in case of a merger a goodwill was also getting created in the depreciation that was available it was completely against the principle of section 43 sub section 6 but despite this fact of the uh, tax neutrality the courts did take a view that it is a matter on which the depreciation should be allowed let me go to a demerger a demerger is actually dividing the company into more than one part that in case there is a company and it has got two businesses one of the businesses gets out of that company and the existing company continues with the remaining businesses and the business which is going out there is a almost identical structure is created where the number of shareholder the shareholders of the amalgamate the demerged company is issued are issued shares in the uh, resulting company in the same proportion so if there are two shareholders holding 30% and 70% shares in a limited if division of uh, a limited is transferred to b limited b limited is expected to issue fresh shares to shareholders of a, uh, a limited in the ratio of 30 and 70 to two shareholders so that's the primary principle so two identical companies can get created of course subject to whatever is the original share capital of that entity which is the resulting company so first and the most important thing that it has to have an undertaking now if you do not satisfy that it is an undertaking in that situation the amalgamation itself would not or the demerger itself would not qualify and if the demerger is not qualified as a demerger there are serious issues which can happen in respect of this part 
I'm not getting into that part as of now. But most important is undertaking is a group of asset or division which constitutes a business activity. You remember that it is an undertaking does not mean that it's an industrial. Don't confuse it with an industrial undertaking. So just to give you an example, and we were facing a similar issue. There was a company which was having an aircraft. And aircraft was run on a commercial basis. It was also given on rent. The question was that in case if this company and that company had losses, uh, if this company merges into another entity, then it will have to claim the set off of losses into that other company. But since aircraft, running of an aircraft was not considered to be an undertaking, industrial undertaking, this would not have satisfied the test of section 72A. But if it was done that the aircraft business was demerged from that existing entity and transferred to the new, transferred to the other company, in that situation, it would amount to a demerger. And therefore, at that time, it was not required that it has to be an industrial taking, it has to be a business. And it could be any sort of a business, it can be even a trading business can be demerged into another entity. Even a securities business can be demerged into another entity. It has to constitute the business. And it need not be all the assets, it could be a group of assets, so long as those group of assets constitute a business activity. In that situation, it can be transferred to another entity. Uh, there has been cases where people have tried and somehow or the other, the courts have taken a very restricted view. And uh, this was especially where we have cases where uh, a, I, I am a company which is running, I am a company and I have a wholly owned subsidiary, which is under me. And I want to transfer and demerge that company. So either I can run the undertaking on my own or I can run an undertaking through a subsidiary. But both are my undertakings. It's only that entity is a separate entity. There have been attempts where people have tried to uh, uh, transfer the company by way of a demerger scheme. And when this was transferred, that company's shares were transferred by treating it as an undertaking. The courts have taken, or the tax department has taken a view that it is not a demerger, which is defined under section 219 AA, and therefore you will not get the tax neutrality. The worst part is what the tax department has done that this would amount to a sale by this company to the new company. So my debt company shares, so fair market value of those shares would be considered to be a transfer. And the shares which are allotted by the new company to the shareholders of the, uh, uh, the demerged company was treated as a dividend which is distributed by a limited, by the demerged company to its shareholders. So double taxation was, double, double uh, venue was done in respect of these type of transactions. Very unfair. What I understand that it has to be an undertaking. Now undertaking can be directly owned by me or it could be owned by me by way of a subsidiary. Uh, so long as I satisfy that test, whether I transfer the whole, and when you are permitting the transfer of undertaking, you must always allow transfer of an undertaking which is held by a subsidiary, wholly owned subsidiary company. These subsidiarization should be permitted when you are you are when the tax department accepts as a concept that a business can be separated. I think the subsidiarization is also the on the same principles and it should have also been accepted. But somehow these principles do not go, and people somehow rather than understanding the economic reasons behind the legislation, they just go by the words of it and then possibly uh, interpret something which is completely contrary to the intention behind those provisions. Be as it may, we have that provision. Uh, all the assets and liabilities of that undertaking uh, uh, are to be transferred. You cannot leave in case of a demerger, whatever is an undertaking, all the assets and liabilities will have to be done. You cannot transfer only the assets and leave the liability. You cannot only transfer the liabilities and leave some of the assets, so long as it has to be an undertaking which is complete undertaking. The transfer of the undertaking has to be at a book value. Now, interesting words are, it is the transfer has to be done at a book value, not the receipt has to be done at the book value. The real issues which come up under the Indias, because Indias requires that whenever there is a business combination and demerger would satisfy the requirement of business combination, whenever there is a demerger which is happening, the new entity will have to, uh, will have to record the transactions unless it is, a, it is a business combination which is within the same group you know, which is what we call it the common control transaction. Unless it is a common control transaction, it will have to be fair value. 
So when the new entity receives the transaction, receives the assets at a common, at a fair, it has to do a fair value. Whether that would be a violation of 219 a Good part is it says that it has to be transferred to the undertaking SP. So the debit entry in the books of the company which is transferring will have to be done at a book value and not the credit entry, which is, or rather the credit entry, because it's an asset. So when it goes out, it's a credit entry has to be done at a book value and not the debit entry, which is the receipt of an asset, which will have to be done at the, at the book value. So that's the view which has been taken, it's not yet tested, but that's something which is interesting that we need to keep it in mind in respect of that, especially in case of India's, there could be an issue which can happen in respect of the future transfer. Consideration or demerger has to be in the form of shares on proportionate basis, to which Vivek G did make a reference that what do we mean by proportionate basis? And, and I'm covering that part in a later part of my presentation. So it has to be done on a, in the form of shares and it is shares and it's not equity shares. I will also deal with that to which also Vivek G did make a reference to this. And uh, 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 shareholders holding at least three fourth in the value of the shares become the shareholder of the amalgamated of the uh, resulting company. And the transfer of an undertaking should be on a going concern basis. So it has to be a going concern basis. And it, in case if it is not, a, it does not satisfy the going concern concept in that situation, 219AA does not get satisfied. So these are the conditions that are required to be satisfied for 219AA. As you would see, the conditions on a merger versus demerger, demerger, the conditions are significantly higher as compared to that. Again, there is a tax neutrality which has been provided in. Uh, in case of a demerger, which satisfies this condition of 219AA. And in 219AA, in the demerger also, the undertaking which gets transferred from the uh, demerged company to the resulting company, when it gets transferred to one company to another, whether there would be a capital gains chargeable to tax, which he says that it is not chargeable to tax in the hands. Similarly, in case of a shareholder, shareholders receive the shares uh, in their hands, uh, whether there would be any capital gains in the hands of the shareholder or whether there would be a 56210, which would be chargeable to tax in the hands of the shareholder, they have provided that they be tax neutral. I will deal with the cases where even if you don't satisfy 219AA, what could be the tax implication in respect of that? That also, we will deal with that in a later part of our my presentation. <clears throat> so my first issue which comes up is that is what happens in case if you issue either an optionally convertible or non-convertible preference shares, whether the preference shares would be considered to be shares and the members would include the uh, 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 shareholders would become, would also include the preference shareholders. So unless and until I satisfy these conditions in that situation, the, so what, what is it that I'm talking about? Here what I'm talking about is uh, there is a merger or a demerger which takes place. And instead of allotting equity shares to the shareholders of the amalgamating or a demerged company, the transfer or transferee company or the resulting company, in both cases, it would be a transferee company. So transfer is the company which receives the undertaking or receives the amalgamated company's assets. They will not allot equity shares, but it will issue either a non-convertible preference shares or it would issue optionally convertible preference shares. So whether it would still satisfy, the proportionality would be maintained that in case of a 10% shareholder would receive 10% of preference shares, which are out of the total 100, 100 preference shares are issued, 10 preference shares would be issued to that person. So that proportionality would be maintained. If you look at these provisions, uh, our view is either it is an NCPS or CCPS or OCPS. Right? That would satisfy the requirement of 219AA clause 4 because 19AA4 talks about issue of shares. Companies Act 13, section 2, subsection 84, share means share in the share capital of a company and include stock. And preference shares are considered as the shares of the company. Section 43 also includes preference share capital as a part of the share capital. Division two of schedule three of the Companies Act, that is balance sheet format for India's company, requires this to be mentioned as the liability, but that is only a disclosure. It is not the character of it, but the nature of it. And that's the reason why it has been considered. 219AA clause five provides 
it says that three fourth on the value of the share. So I think issuance of shares would be considered to be a shares and it would therefore satisfy the condition of section 219AA4. Similarly, 219AA5 provides that the shareholders holding three fourths in the value of the sh uh, become, sh uh, become shareholders of the resulting company. Now shareholders, the term shareholder is not defined, but the term member has been defined and every person holding shares of the company is defined as a member of the company. Since the definition of shares include preference shares, the preference shareholder is also a member. Section 55 of the Companies Act refers to preference shareholders as the shareholders. And similarly, in case of State Bank of India versus Altham Power, you know, that also the preference shareholders have been treated as a separate class of shareholders. When you are talking about a separate class of shareholders, you are in any case shareholders. So in view of all these provisions, it is very strongly said that either a redeemable preference shares or no CPS would satisfy the condition. See, the question that arises, let me go to the, why would you issue preference shares? And then let me, let me, let me give you some of the schemes which, have, which we have banned already. Now, let's take a situation that there is a 40% shareholder in the company. Now, that 40% shareholder in the company wants to get out of that company. Now, I am another 60% shareholder. I don't have enough money to pay to that shareholder. But the company has got enough capital in the company. Let's take a situation that he has to be paid 30 crores of rupees for his 40% shares. The company has 30 crores. But now let's look at it that how can I pay 30 crores to him? If the company has 30 crores on account of extra borrowing that it can do, etc. What I can do is, the only way we get 30 crores is declared as a dividend. If 30 crores is declared as a dividend, then I pay dividend distribution tax or I pay tax in the hands of the shareholders as dividend, uh, dividend tax. 18 crores come, net of tax. Thereafter, I make payment. Again, that person pays the capital gains tax in respect of his amount. So it's a very tax inefficient manner. But just think about it. This company gets merged into another company. And when it merges into another entity, the company allots optionally convertible preference shares to both the shareholders. And when it issue optionally convertible preference shares, the shareholder which is going to retain the control will convert his shares, whereas the person who is going out of the company will not opt exercise, but he will ask for redemption. And when he asks for the redemption of the shares, the shares are redeemed and he gets the capital. He still pays capital gains tax. But it's only one capital gains tax that he pays. He does not pay any dividend distribution tax. And the, so this is the way in which it can be done. We had done a demerger. We had used demerger for the purpose of uh, carrying out a similar transaction where there were three brothers who were doing three businesses in the same entity. We demerged two of the businesses out of that entity. And each of the demerger, each of the shareholders were allotted optionally convertible preference shares. And the brothers which were not getting out of those respective businesses did not exercise their option. Whereas the brother which was to retain the business continued to exercise their option. They became the whole shareholder and the payments were made to the other shareholders on that basis. And those payments were used for the purpose of buying the shares of the other entity in respect of. So that was the way in which it could be done. So only some capital gains it was not a tax saving, but multiple levels of taxes were saved in respect of that. Similarly, this can be also used when you want to sell your business to an entity and if it is part of the business. So we were looking at a company where there were two businesses. One was, uh, let's take a situation, one was a chemical business and another one was plastic processing. Plastic processing business was supposed to be sold off to someone. What would happen that this was demerged, so the, the acquirer incorporated a new company, in, invested some capital into that entity. The businesses were demerged into that entity. And the demerged entity issue allotted if redeemable preference shares to the shareholders of the existing company. The uh, redeemable preference share, the company purchased this uh, share. So the, the uh, new, uh, the redeemable preference shares were acquired by the uh, concerned person. And that's how the transaction was completed in respect of this part. A very interesting way in which it can be done. And in that situation, it is possible to do these type of transactions where you can use the restructuring as a part of the any strategy that you do. 
So therefore, an RPS or an OCPS can be very uh, conveniently used for the purpose of meeting with your other commercial objectives in respect of a transaction. So there could be also payment of cash to some shareholders. Now we were implementing a, a similar scheme wherein some of the shareholders were non-residents. Now, as you know, the under the uh, FEMA uh, uh, OCPS or redeemable preference shares are treated as ECBs, and therefore there is a prohibition of allotment of OCPS or RPS to the non-resident shareholders. We are ten percent shareholders who are the who are the uh, uh, who are non-residents and I could not issue uh, RPS to them. So in that situation, what I did was I paid cash to them. The question that arose that whether it would, uh, on a demerger, the question arose whether it is a violation of section 219AA4, because 219AA4 says that I have to allot shares on a proportionate basis to the shareholders. We said that you have not allotted proportionate shareholders, uh, uh, shares, you have 10%, so the rest of the shareholders have been allotted slightly more shares than what they would have been entitled in case if all shareholders were allotted shares. Uh, I think what we understand and what we interpret this year, that both the clauses, that is 219AA4 and also 219AA5 will have to be read together. When 219AA5 requires only 75% of the shareholders to continue, the principles of proportionality will have to be applied only with respect to the shareholders which continue and not in respect of all the universe of shareholders. Because when they are accepting, otherwise 219AA5 would never be into picture at all. It can never come into effect because in all cases, wherever there is even one shareholder who is not allotted shares, in that situation, principle of proportionality would be gone. So in that situation, our view is that proportionality went. So in case if you are allotting shares, you are allotting shares on a proportionate basis. Otherwise, there is no requirement. There could be some shareholders who could be cash. There could be some, so long as you satisfy three-fourth condition. So that's what is our view. And we have actually implemented amalgamation schemes and ad merger schemes on those basis. Uh, similar issue can come also in case of merger. Uh, let's take a situation in addition. So, for example, in case if the shares, if, in case if every shareholder is allotted, in case of a ad merger, there is a cash which is paid in addition to the shares. In that situation, whether it can be it can be considered as because the language which is used that whether there is a consideration other than cash also. What it says that the shares are issued proportionate. It does not say that there is a, uh, the only consideration which is paid is by way of a share. It says that the consideration, uh, section 47.8 provides, so this section 47.8, which seven, which deals with the merger, it provides that the, the shareholders are given the shares in proportion to this. It does not say that the only consideration which is given. So there are conflicting views which are there in case that, but the predominant view, in fact, there is a master Raghuvi trust which decides, but it's all completely on a different ground. It takes a decision. There's a decision in case of city corp, city M corporation, which is actually, honestly speaking, no decision. Honestly speaking, if you read the decision, we say that it has only followed master Raghuvi trust and taken a decision. And only decision which is worth here is Gautam Sarabhai Trust number two, which is Gujarat High Court decision, wherein they have said that these type of conditions, so in case if there is any cash, which is anything which is paid in extra, either a cash or either a dividend, uh, 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 either debentures, anything which is paid in extra uh, in case of a merger or a demerger, that would be considered violative of provisions of section 47.7. And when it is violative of section 47.7, this would not pass the test and therefore the shareholders would not get the exemption which is available under the uh, 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 under the provisions of the act uh, it may in one case it may still satisfy the test of the company getting the exemption but the shareholders may not continue to get an exemption the view that emerges while it would be a demerger under section 219 aa it would still not be a demerger under section 476d so the company will get the exemption, but the shareholders will not. Now, if the shareholders do not get, whether the 
uh, uh, whether there would be a still a tax under section 45 because you know if you look at section 45 in case of a demerger whether any capital gains would arise or not you know in demerger what happens i continue to hold my original shares i am allotted fresh shares when am i allotted fresh shares even if there is no exemption which is given to me there cannot be any capital gains because unless there is a capital asset and there is a transfer of a capital asset there cannot be a capital gain in section 451 fundamental rule is capital asset and a transfer since i continue to hold my original shares there cannot be considered to be a transfer under section 45 and therefore there cannot be any capital gain which can be chargeable to tax on case of a demerger merely because i receive an additional share okay the other aspect which is required to be seen whether it would be still you know because i have not paid any consideration for the purpose of receiving these shares whether 56210 can apply and therefore on the fair market value of the shares which i have received whether it can be chargeable to tax in my hands Now, section section fifty six two ten says that where I receive the shares without payment of any consideration or with or a consideration which is less than the fair market value, the question here is: Can it be said that I have received these shares without consideration? I have because the principle is: If you look at the Income Tax Act, also recognizes I have there is a reduction. in the value of the existing shares because the shares which i have holding that has been reduced in value and that is the consideration which i have paid and as you had seen in case of shirin bai kuka and other decisions not shirin bai kuka uh, another decision wherein says that where there is an issue of right shares etc there is a bifurcation of the value from the original shares and original shares and the new shares and whatever is the reduction in the value of the original shares becomes the consideration which is paid for the new shares and therefore and since the principle is the same that is an exact reduction in the value of the shares which is happening and therefore it cannot be said even section 56 to 10 cannot be applied in my case however let me tell you that there is a decision where which has uh, which has taxed a demerger which does not satisfy 219 a very very severely so be very careful when you uh, do this transaction you have to be extremely careful to see that if it is not an exemption if you do not get an exemption or it does not satisfy 219aa it can result into a significant problem in respect of that so i already said that it could be very useful in case of sale of a division or a distribution of business among the partners or family these are actually done by us in respect of some of the transactions these are tried and tested uh, methods for the for the doing it and it could be pretty of uh, pretty efficient in respect of that uh, for the purpose of ensuring that there are no double level taxes which are paid Uh, so there at the time of demerger there would not be any tax in case if you issue the ncps but at the time when the uh, share uh, ncps are and no tax in the hands of the shareholders also but when the ncps are redeemed i'll just come to the next slide which talks about taxability in case of a tax neutral at the time of redemption of ncps the cost of ncps will be arrived by allocated arrived at by allocation of cost of acquisition of my original shares in the in the ratio of the Uh, in the ratio of the assets as per the provisions of section 49 sub section 2c uh, the amount received on redemption would be considered as the full value of consideration received and just to mention that in case of anarkali sarabhai they have already held the redemption of preference shares would be considered to be a transfer which is chargeable to tax and the amount received on redemption would be treated as the full value of consideration the date of acquisition of ncps would be the same of same as uh, the period of holding of ncps for taking short term or a long term capital gain and redemption of shares will be treated as extinguishment of shares uh, that's what i have just mentioned in grace college and anarkali subject to indexation the difference will be taxable as capital gain uh, there is a view which is being taken by some of the persons including some persons in my office where they have said that a redemption of preference shares with the change in the definition which is covered under the provisions of section 115q or whatever section which charges it the earlier the buyback of share was defined as buyback under the provisions of section 77k of the income tax act, of the companies act now they have said that buyback by any 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 uh, uh, under any law in force or any in any any manner whatsoever that's what is the provision 
So therefore, the view which is expressed is that a buyback could also be considered, a, a redemption can also classify as a buyback of shares. And if it is classified as a buyback of shares, in that situation, there could be, instead of capital gains payable by the individual shareholders, it can also amount to a, uh, a, a capital gain. Uh, it could be also considered to be a, a distribution of, uh, tax on buyback, which could be payable in the company. The cost of acquisition of those, the, uh, the money which is received at the time of allotment of shares, practically there may not be exactly the same because the shares are allotted the same value and it is redeemed also in the same value. In that situation, there may not be any tax under the dividend distribution tax or the uh, profit distribution tax or whatever 115Q or, uh, that it provides for. So it is only a single point of taxation, only capital gains. Otherwise, in other cases, it could be the, say, for example, if the business was transferred, there would be a capital gain which the company would have paid. Thereafter, when the amounts would have been distributed to the individual shareholders, it would have again paid the dividend tax in the hands of the shareholder. All these things in this situation of a business sale can be avoided or at least it can be done in a more efficient manner. Uh, uh, Non-tax neutral demerger, as I said, that there has been a significant impact. There could be, you must also see that there could be 50B has been amended. So one of the view which we have taken can may not also take into, because what we have said that it amounts to, even if it is a, a, a sale, even if it's a tax uh, non-neutral, even if you consider the decision which has been done that it is amounts to a transfer and therefore capital gains payable by the company, which is in a demerger, and the shares which are allotted would be treated as a dividend which is paid by the company which has transferred the assets. Uh, in that situation, there is a possibility that the arguments which were taken, one of the argument, another alternate argument was taken that it amounts to a slump exchange, even if it is a transfer, and therefore not chargeable to tax in the hands of the transferor company. Now, those have no, are not applicable because there has been change in the definition of slum sale uh, under section two, subsection 42C. And also, there is also a change for the purpose of determination of the full value of consideration. Section 50B also has been changed for the purpose of considering in respect of valuation. So we will come to that particular part when we come to that particular aspect. Uh, I, uh, in case of taxability, in case of non-tax neutral uh, demerger, in case of shareholder, I've already covered that this may not actually be chargeable to tax. Uh, Dun Kapadia, et cetera, these decisions which are available, where, which, where we can say that neither 56.2 or section 47.60 uh, can apply in respect of uh, their, uh, their case. And therefore, shareholders may still not be chargeable to tax at all uh, in respect of this. Mm. Now, let me, let me go to the aspect of mergers and demergers and impact on the carry forward and on our sub losses and depreciation. So uh, provisions of section 72A read with section nine, rule 9C. Uh, uh, significant law changes have happened over a period of years, but in case of a merger, where a loss making company merges into a profit making company, uh, which we call it the normal merger or a 72A merger, uh, the entire losses and depreciation which are there of an amalgamating company uh, migrate to the new entity, provided the terms and conditions are satisfied. Mm. And these depreciation losses of it remains continues to remain the losses and depreciation of the respective years. It does not attain the character of the current year losses. And therefore, in case if eight years are expiring, it would expire in the same day before merger and after merger. However, for the purpose of a merger, there are additional conditions which are required to be satisfied. These principles of migration would apply only if it is an industrial undertaking or a ship or a hotel or a banking company or a PSU or an erstwhile PSU, which has gone through a disinvestment process. It is only in such type of cases, the advantages of migration would apply. So theoretically, if it is a, an aircraft or if it is a training business, or if it is a it is a it is a business that we call it as a non-manufacturing uh, non-industrial non undertaking type business. In that situation, they may not get the benefit in respect of this part. Uh, so you need to be very careful before just implementing it. You must say that you are fulfilling the requirement of industrial undertaking as defined in section 72A. Second, what it says that the business which is to which these losses or depreciation pertains 
that should be in existence for at least a period of three years. If it is not existing for three years, then this benefit of migration would not allow. Second, at least three fourths of the assets which are held by the amalgamating company two years prior to the amalgamation should be part of, should continue. It should be held on the date of amalgamation. The amalgamating company must hold. It should not have disposed of most of his assets. 75% of the assets should be continued with it. These assets, at least three fourths in value, are continued by held by the amalgamated company for a period of five years. So let's take a situation that you had 100 rupees assets, 80 rupees assets come to the new entity, then new entity has to at least retain 60 rupees worth of assets for a period of next five years. And it continues to remain the same, continue the same business for a period of five years. This is, these are the important conditions. If these conditions are, and then there is an additional say that such other conditions as may be prescribed. And those conditions under rule 9C primarily talks about capacity utilization. And it says that it achieves at least five, 50% of the capacity over a period of three years and continues to be so for a period of five years or so. There is an additional condition which has been satisfied. So the condition in respect of migration of losses of one entity to another entity are significant and you need to ensure that all such conditions are satisfied. In case if you fail to satisfy these conditions, then whatever is carried forward which has been allowed will be treated as the income of the year in which these conditions are dissatisfied. So for example, in the, in the, in the third year, you sell off 30, 40% of the assets. In that situation, whatever set off which has been allowed to you in the earlier period would be disallowed to you. So that's very important that you need to keep it in mind in respect of. There are very complex issues which come up in our case. And we had done a merger which was of a hotel. And this was done under Section 72, and the benefit of 72 was taken. After three years, there was a proposal to do another merger with another entity. The question was that when I do a merger, whether it would amount to that I have not retained those assets or not. There was also a proposal that we, if I do a demerger of that business from my entity to another entity in that situation, whether I would be able to get it. The complex issue was that if I do a demerger, the loss to which it pertained to that those assets, in any case, migrates to the new company. If it migrates to a new company, whether the question is whether it's a violation or it is not a violation. So these are very interesting issues which can come up and you need to examine it. We had taken a view that in case there is a demerger which happens, even if on account of demerger, if those assets are migrated to new entity, it is possible to contend that section 72A may not be violated. In case of a demerger, it is far more simpler. There are no conditions. In fact, even trading business can be demerged. Even a uh, aircraft can be demerged. Even a construction business can be demerged. Anything can be demerged so long as it satisfies the condition of a undertaking under section 219. Now it says that in case if there is a demerger, the losses will have to be classified into two parts, specific directly relatable losses to the undertaking or the depreciation to their undertaking, which is so demerged, that would automatically get migrated to the new entity. The losses which are not so specific about those assets or those undertakings, in that case, they will be allocated in the proportion of assets retained versus assets transferred. And to the extent of assets transferred, to that extent, those losses will migrate to the new entity. And the most important thing is that losses and depreciation would become losses and depreciation of the year in which the demerger takes place. So you get a fresh lease of eight years when it talks about the accumulated losses. So you get a fresh period of eight years in respect of losses which are so transferred. The original company will continue to have the losses of the respective years. The second more important thing is that when it becomes the losses of the current year, the provisions of section 79 will have to be applied considering the current year and any changes which are taking place from the earlier year. So for example, you demerge into a new entity, the losses go to the new entity and the same year you transfer the entire shareholding of the new entity. There is no problem. Section 79 will still protect you. So let me give you an example. I have a business where I have got 50 crores of losses. Now I've got another small business, which is that, say for example, it has got 10 crores of value, no losses. Now, if I demerge, the, and if I want to sell this company, what if I, in case if I sell this company, 
then I will lose all the losses which are there, which is 50 crores, because Section 79 will come into picture. But let's take a situation that I emerge this business with 50 crores of losses into another entity. And in that another entity, I sell that company in the same year in which the demerger takes place. In that situation, there would not be any loss of that uh, accumulated uh, uh, losses because Section 79 says that the shareholding, the, the shareholders holding at least 50% of the share voting power on the last date of the year to which the loss pertains continue to hold 50% shares in the year in which I claim the set off. So if I change the shareholding in the same year, in that situation, I would still not violate the conditions of section 79 and therefore could be entitled without any restriction, continue to carry forward and set off these losses. So in such a situation where a loss making company is proposed to be sold off to someone, especially unlisted company, we are not talking about listed entities, we are talking about because section 79 only applies to closely held companies. So only where the closely held companies are supposed to be transferred, in such a situation, it may be possible for you to contend that section 79 may not apply. Coming to the reverse merger, now where reverse merger is the case where you don't want to follow and fulfill the conditions of section 72, or you may not be eligible for 72. Right? In that situation, what happens that a profit making company merges into the loss making company. All these things that I'm saying, you must always see the cost of transfers, etc., to which a reference could be made by my subsequent speaker on the stamp duty implications, etc. But be as it may, in case if you can transfer the profit making company into the uh, loss making company, this is known typically as a, as a reverse merger. The biggest problem that happens in case of a reverse merger is when loss making company is uh, a, a profit making company, there's a change in the shareholding. And if the change in the shareholding is beyond 51%, 50%, in that situation, the entire loss would be uh, lost. So you have to be very careful in respect of planning, in respect of this, for the purpose of ensuring that the losses are not lost out. It is also important that you need to see that even if, say, for example, you lose the losses, uh, you don't lose the depreciation. Because Section 79 only applies to accumulated losses. It does not apply to unabsorbed depreciation. And therefore, you must always keep it in mind that, say, for example, in case of a reverse merger, even if there is a 79 violation, if the losses are less, that is, the cash losses are less and depreciation is high in that situation, you can still continue to claim the continue to claim uh, depreciation for all the years. In any case, depreciation is always the depreciation of the year. Even accumulated depreciation becomes the depreciation of the current year. So in any case, Section 79 may not have an impact. But under the law also, that the Section 79 does not apply to unabsorbed. Uh, uh, to uh, unabsorbed depreciation. Uh, let me let me tell you something which is very interesting, which is happening, uh, and uh, in case of acquisitions, etc. And uh, I I want to deal with only a couple of aspects, and that is in respect of Mauritius. And we had some very interesting things that had happened. Now. <clears throat> We had a company, a Mauritius company, which was holding shares in the Indian entity. And as you know, in the Mauritius Treaty and in Singapore Treaty, in both the cases, the provisions are that if a person who is resident of a Mauritius or resident of Singapore, if they hold shares in the Indian company in, and they transfer the shares of the Indian company, in that situation, the capital gains will not be payable in India, but capital gains will be payable either in Mauritius, Mauritius or Singapore, meaning where the transferor is the resident. And neither of these two countries levy tax in respect of capital gains. So therefore, this goes completely tax-free. This was the provision till the 2017, 1st of April 2017. Both the treaties underwent change. And because of the change, now, capital gains on the transfer of shares of an Indian company by a resident of Mauritius or resident of, resident of uh, Singapore would become chargeable to tax in India. However, they were provided for a grandfathering. And grandfathering means that in case if the shares are acquired prior to 1st of April 2017, in that situation, they will continue to enjoy the exemptions for continuous for the period of 
uh, its lifetime till such time that person transfers the shares. The question that arose in our case is that I was holding shares in this entity much prior to 1st of April 2017. After 1st of April 2017, the companies got merged and I got the shares of the amalgamated company. Now, this merger took place after 1st of April 2017. The question that arose is whether I would still entitle to get the grandfather. The interesting issue is section 2, subsection 42A mentions that in case the shares which are allotted either at the time of a demerger or on account of a merger, the date of acquisition of the original shares in exchange of which or in response in respect of which I am allotted fresh shares would be considered to be the date of acquisition or the period of acquisition will be considered for the purpose of section 242A. Whether the same definition can be applied and therefore in case if I transfer the shares of the new company, whether I can take the benefit of grandfathering provisions, that's the issue which is coming up. So, this was an issue which was important, which had come into effect. We have taken a view that it would be entitled to benefit because the intention of the grandfathering provisions is any capital gain which arises on account of the shares which I held earlier will continue to enjoy the exemption till its lifetime. And that's the reason why I would continue to, and this is nothing but an exchange of the shares for shares. So whatever capital gain which accrues to me on account of those shares, the character would be less and the principle is similar and therefore we should be able to get this back. In the there is an interesting issue, which I would, of course, not directly relatable to this, but what happens, let's say, for example, I am an Indian, Indian resident today. I have been holding shares of a company for decades. So, for example, I was holding shares of an Indian company for about 15 years. I individually, I become resident of Singapore, say, for example, in 2021-22. I become a resident of Singapore, accepted for valid reasons, economic reasons, everything. The question is whether I would be entitled to take the benefit of treaty because I become a resident. The shares are acquired prior to 1st of April 2017. And therefore, I satisfy all the conditions whether I would be entitled. A very interesting situation. There are cases like, say, for example, and there is a concept of, he call it as a uh, uh, the change of domicile of an entity. And that's in international uh, uh, international uh, tax laws, international uh, corporate laws. It is a pretty common situation where migration from one country to another is, we call it as a re-domiciliation of a company. So a company which is, say, for example, a resident of uh, Germany can be re-domiciled into a company of Netherlands or it can be domiciled into a company of Singapore, subject to, of course, the internal regulations. I'm not saying that every such things are permissible, but there are so several jurisdictions to permit. So let's take a situation that there is a company which I have, and that company is presently a domiciled company of, let's take a situation that it's domiciled of Cyprus. And this Cyprus entity thereafter changes its seat of management to Singapore, and its place of effective management becomes that of Singapore. And when it's place of effective management, it becomes a resident of Singapore under the tax laws of Singapore. And if it becomes, and this company was holding shares of an Indian entity for a period of more than prior to 1st of April 2017. If it does that, whether it would be entitled to take this benefit, provided it satisfied the condition that the change in the location of that entity or place of effective management is for a pure economic reasons, not for tax reasons whether it would be entitled. A very interesting issue, situation. I hold a view that it would be entitled to. It is required to be tested, but that's something which is a very interesting, even planning opportunity, which is available in respect of these parts. This brings me to slump sale and slump exchange. Uh, as the, you know, I always have been telling that the, the drafting is an art. It's no longer, no longer a, uh, uh, no longer a, uh, uh, I would say, uh, something which is a scientific thing because 
No, I have seen n number of times. People who is drafting get so much carried away by the words that he uses that he either uses extra superfluous words, which destroys the entire purpose, which destroys the entire intention. And some of the examples I would give you. You know, we had section 36 2, which talks about the uh, borrowing cost. And originally it used to provide any amount which is borrowed for the purpose of business, right? For the purpose of business was allowed as a reduction. So n number of decisions, including Tata Chemicals, et cetera, which came up, he said that even if I have done incurred an expenses for the purpose of expansion, for the purpose of acquiring capital, et cetera, et cetera, was also for the purpose of business. And it does not make a distinction between capital expenditure versus revenue expenditure. And therefore, that was also allowed. And court successively allowed that. This was not liked by the tax department, rightly so. So therefore, they amended the law. And let me tell you, I did play a part in respect of that. I said that if you really don't want to allow, don't allow it. You, know, you make an amendment section 30. You know that there is a lacuna in the law. If you really want to make it similar to that of the accounting treatment, you amend the law. So they amended the law. And what did they do? They say that any, essay, any expenses which are incurred for the purpose of acquiring capital assets, they should have stopped at that. But then in that extra smartness, they said for the purpose of extension or expansion of a business, what was the difference between the cup? The accounting world does accept that any expenses which is incurred for acquiring a capital asset is a capital cost. It will have to be capitalized. They should have stopped. They did not stop. And therefore, even after the amendment, in most of the cases, what is an extension of business versus expansion of business? And therefore, nothing. similar thing happened in case of Section 50B. In Section 242C, they used the surplus words. And those words are slum sale means the transfer of one or, one, or one or more undertaking, the definition of transfer. As a result of some consideration without being assigned to individual assets and liabilities of such sale. So it means transfer of one or under any as a result of the sale, that is what it says. Right? What was the need for mentioning these words? So therefore, you know, what was said that what we what I used to say that sale is not same as exchange. That word transfer includes exchange, but that is exchange is not sale. And there are enough number of Supreme Court decisions say that sale is different than the exchange. And therefore, you know, the, the, say for example, if I do a transfer of an undertaking in exchange of shares of another entity or in exchange of redeemable preference shares or in respect of, you know, 90% of cash and 10% of preference shares, all these things would be considered as a slump exchange and therefore not qualified within the definition of section 242C and section 243 is not a slump sale. Provision of section 50B, which talks about cost of acquisition of an asset will not apply. And Allah, you know, we have B.C. Srinivas Shetty, which is possibly the person who, who has lived far more than what is life on account of these things. And therefore, B.C. Srinivas Shetty, which talks about that in case if the mechanism fails, the charge fails. And if the charge fails, Section 50. So all cases of slump exchanges were completely getting out of tax net. As a part of various discussions that we were having in case of ICDS, and I think I'm, I'm reminded of what was uh, told by the, your president, saying that you know, he was part of the income tax uh, portal uh, or the committee, which uh, talks about the development of the new portal. I was part of the committee which uh, formulated the tax account standard, which was named as income computation and disclosure standards, which is ICDS. So, I was part of that committee. And during the course of committee, I told them that, look, what are you doing? So Section 36 amendment came on account of various interactions with the board on that particular thing. Similarly, in case of some section, I said, what are you doing? You, are you aware that people are taking left, right, and center the advantages of this lecture in the law? After 10 years, we'll come up and do a retrospective amendment. If you really want to do an amendment, do it now. Why are you waiting for 10 years? He said, no, 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 it's still under debate. I said, why are you waiting for debate to get completed? You know that there is a debate. You clarify if your intention is to text them, text them now. 
if you do not intend to do it then let them then then don't change it later on from a retrospective basis so that's how they made the changes and now of course there is a change similar thing which was happening section 50c now i was possibly having i was having a, a client with a huge amount of real estate as a part of his business and the question was that in case if i sell those real estate to another entity then section 50c would apply and there would be a huge amount of cap in fact there was a proposal that this was to be sold to another entity the question was in case if i do it as a sale i will have to do it at least as a stamp duty value even to an associate even for a part of a corporatization process even as a part of a de merger even as a part of a division of uh, uh, business between the two brothers i will still have to do it in an fmb and i have to pay a huge amount of tax without realizing it but in case if it is treated as an undertaking now section 50c applies only to a land or building or both it does not apply to anything else undertaking is neither land nor building nor it is a uh, uh, not nor both it is a business or it is an undertaking and the law says an undertaking is a separate asset the law itself also section 50b also says that an, an uh, undertaking is to be treated as a separate asset on a slump so when i do this business with all the real estate if i transfer it to another undertaking section 50c does not apply so i can still transfer it at a book value or my value of the cost of acquisition i can sell it section 50c could not be applied so people used to transfer the businesses at of the entity on a slump sale basis without substituting and this was the second misuse which was happening in respect of section uh, of the going concern transactions in finance act 2021 with effect from 1st of april 2000 see amendment relating to goodwill amendment relating to the slump exchange uh, these have taken place with effect from 1st of april 2021 i don't want that you miss out on this particular and therefore applicable to assessment year 2122 they are retroactive in operation in a way meaning it applies even to the transactions which were completed after 1st of april 2020 but before the date on which these amendments were announced so there are several cases where people have been caught uh, off guard and therefore they may be exposed to a significant two amendments have been done one is definition of slump sale has been uh, the slump sale has been changed and by undertaking by any means instead of under transfer of undertaking by sale by way of a sale instead of that they have said by way, by any means so therefore slump exchange is covered in the definition of slump sale so theoretically slump sale is chargeable to tax for the purpose of ensuring that people do not undervalue the undertaking sale they have very clearly provided that slump sale or slump exchange will have to be done at a fair market value you cannot and fair market value or is on the same principles as 11 ua uh, uh, meaning that all the real estate that you have will have to be substituted with at least the stamp duty value and the net worth will have to be worked out of the undertaking and that net worth will have to be the minimum value in case if you have transferred at a value which is lower than that then that will be treated as a fair value of the consideration the and this theoretically by way of an amendment it applies because the law has been amended with effect from 1st of april 2020 20 that a fair value will be what they have said that fair value should be the as may be prescribed right so that is what is the way in which and 11 the only saving grace here is the amendment to section rule 11 uab was introduced with effect from 24th of may 2021 and this amendment to the law has not been made retrospective that is the rule has not been retrospectively introduced and therefore there for the period from 1st of april 2020 to 24th of may 2021 there was no rule which was applicable for the purpose of determination of the fair market value of the asset or undertaking which is so transferred as a going concern on a slum slum sale basis and therefore it is possible to take a view that there is no need for substitution of the fair market value even if fair market value is more than the uh, actual consideration which has been transferred at the time of transaction 
So that's a saving grace here that you may need to take into consideration. If in, because of the slump exchange, there are so many internal transactions that we used to do, which is pure economic transactions that has gotten, it should not generally have any tax implication. Like say, for example, an internal restructuring, it becomes taxable, even where there is an internal structuring with the two brothers, one brother takes over one business and it's transferred to one entity. Now these are done, these were originally done earlier at the book values because ultimately it is in the way of a family partition. When we used to do that, that is not possible. The parent company transferring to a known wholly owned subsidiaries. It is a subsidiary, but it is transferred at that time. There is no need for I mean, it is done for commercial reasons or any known wholly owned subsidiary transferring one of their divisions back to the parent company, a subsidiary company transferring to fellow. Now, all these entities should not result into any sort of a capital gain. But even those type of transactions now would attract capital gains because you will have to do it at a fair market value. There is a minimum value which is to be at which it has to be done. The transfer to a whole a whole year subsidiary plus preferential allotment, which is done, the entire capital gain on this is chargeable to tax in respect of that. So, you know, I'm coming to what can be done possibly in such type of a situation. And, you know, can a stump, a stump exchange be made exempt under gift or a demerger, et cetera? I think, do I have the next slide on account? Huh. Now let's take a situation and we, uh, I'll, I'll suggest what are, what are the possibilities of doing a structuring on account. Now let's take a situation that I've got an undertaking. Now I have an undertaking and I transfer that undertaking to a wholly owned subsidiary. At let's take a situation either at a book value, purely at a book value, I believe. Now, since it is not a transfer, the question of attracting any of the sections would not apply. Because it's not a transfer, it's not chargeable to tax and all. Now, what happens is that thereafter, and you remember the words which is used in section 47 is that any transfer to a wholly on any transfer not regarded as a transfer. Right? So it does not qualify to be a transfer at all for the purpose of income. After that, you know, after some period, this wholly owned subsidiary ceases to be a wholly owned subsidiary. So naturally, the tax would be levied under section 47A because 47A says the amounts of profits and gains from transfer of such capital gain shall be deemed to be income chargeable to add under the capital gain in the year in which the company ceases to be a wholly owned subsidiary. The question is, what is profits and gains from the transfer? But this is not regarded as a transfer at all. If it is not regarded as a transfer, the question of levying tax does not arise, even under section 47A. Because what it taxes is capital gain arising from a transfer. Transfer to a wholly owned subsidiary is not a transfer. And therefore, whether you can claim it this way, okay? a fine point which can be done. Similarly, section 50B, 50C, and 112, et cetera, also fail because each of these provisions say that as a result of such transfer. And as we have seen, section 47 treats that any transfer from a company to a wholly owned subsidiary is not regarded as a transfer. So can it be done? A very interesting aspect that you need to examine. I'm not saying that these are all fail-proof provisions. You don't know how the courts are going to interpret. And you must always remember, you know, and this is not to be listened by the persons who are corporate executives. Uh, the reason is because you know, this is more for professionals. It is a litigation which thrive us. Our duty is to warn the uh, corporate uh, executives and the promoters about the risks which are involved in it. But in case if they take the risk and it is our duty to provide, I think these are the provisions which can be probably made use of. There is a very interesting aspect which can be done. So let's take a situation that a wholly owned, there is a wholly owned subsidiary. So I have a company and I transfer my asset to a wholly owned subsidy. And it is by way of a gift. And you must always remember that you must provide that the, the memorandum and articles of the holding company must have the provision for giving gifts. Now, if gives a gift to a wholly owned subsidiary, it's a commercially feasible transaction. Why should I take money from it? It's my own bacha. It doesn't matter whether I take money or not. So I transfer it by way of a gift. And as you know, section 47 also says that gift is not regarded as a transfer. 
and if gift is not regarded as a transfer, neither provisions of section 47, uh, this would not be chargeable to tax and even section 56 to 10 may not apply in such type of a situation. So if section 56 does not apply, and as a Pradama, there is no chargeability of to tax in respect of this transaction. After that, if it converts itself into a non wholly owned subsidiary, in that situation, neither 56 to 10 at, can apply at that point in time, nor original section 47 can apply, or, the, or 47A can apply, because uh, there was no consideration paid. There is no retrospectivity that, okay, uh, the gift which was originally treated as a gift will now not be treated as a gift, etc. So that is also possible. In all these things, you must always keep it in mind, keep car in mind, right? These are all great things to say when I speak in a lecture, but when it comes to implementation, you have to be 100% sure as to what you do and what sort of a documentation which is implemented in respect of this part. Goodwill on account of merger, I think I do not have enough time. I What I can do is, uh, you already know that now, but I think the only thing which I would want to mention is, that it is only goodwill. And what we used to do was all the surplus value, which was either represented by way of the goodwill, by way of a technical know-how, licenses, unregistered patents, a customer race, non-compete consideration, all these things were clubbed into goodwill. And it was classified as a goodwill. And since the depreciation was available on goodwill, we used to claim depreciation on that including in case of slump purchase in respect of anything which I used to do, there was a balance amount, whatever is the tangible assets, I allot value to a tangible assets and the rest of the things were valued at goodwill, which included several components of it. The question here is that now the goodwill depreciation is dissolved. Is it possible for me to reallocate those value in, from goodwill to different other assets and thereafter make a claim? According to me, it's a good case because we have always been contending that goodwill is a composition of several things. The amendment which has been made applies only to take the value of the goodwill as zero, not all self-generated assets. And therefore, in case if I have acquired some asset under the, uh, under the share purchase agreement, if I have acquired certain assets or under the business purchase agreement, if I have acquired certain assets and certain amount was allocated as goodwill, it may be a good idea to re-bifurcate into goodwill under the technical know-how, under the licenses, under the uh, distribution network uh, money, under the customer list, under the non-compete, it can be bifurcated into those things. And once you do it, you can claim depreciation in respect of each of these items and claim the deduction and depreciation in respect of those items. Uh, I will not go into cross-border acquisitions because these are something which is which I thought that in case if I'm unable to, comp to utilize your full time, in that situation, I will also get into some other cross-border acquisition issues in respect of treaty provisions. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Mayurji, Vivekji. Uh, let me know in case if there is, uh, I have already exhausted my time. You can now take over and you can, let me know in case uh, you want to have some questions. I may still have about five minutes. If there are some questions, I can take some questions on this. Sure, sir. Thank you so much. We have a few questions in the chat box. Uh, uh, we may take Neil Saji. You have you have asked two three questions. So if, quickly, if you can unmute and ask the question directly, it would be great. Are you there, Neil Saji? No, I I can I can see. Let me let me do one thing. Let me let me go through the questions because I can read those questions myself. So instead of someone coming and unmuting yourself, I I would straight away go to those questions. And the first one is. When the demerger is used as a tool for family settlement, how the control of the company will be acquired when the shares are allotted on proportionate basis on the resulting company? So I think it's a very interesting question. So what we do is that when I when I uh, do a family settlement, uh, let's take a situation. There are three brothers who are having the shares of an X entity, and uh, it is demerged. And as a part of the family settlement, one of the business is taken over by one brother. I'm just giving one example. Now, what happens is that that business is demerged into another entity which is set up by the brother, which is going to take over. He has, say, for example, one crore of equity, which is put into that entity, one crore of cash and one crore of equity into that entity. When the business gets demerged into that entity, the what happens is that the money is transferred to that entity, uh, the business is transferred, and in exchange, the three brothers in their respective ratio are allotted not uh, redeemable preference shares. 
So when there are optionally convertible redeemable preferences, the two brothers, which are not going to continue, they will ask for redemption, not ask for conversion. Whereas the brother, which is going to retain the control, he will ask for a conversion. So he will be the only shareholder, which is the original one crore of equity. Plus, he will also be entitled to he would also be entitled to the balance of he would also be entitled to the entire uh, the new shares which are allotted to him and the balance to brothers would get the cash which is coming on account of this separation of this business so that is one way so similarly the second brother can be done on this basis and the money which the first brother gets on account of this he will give it to the other brothers for the purpose of acquiring the shares from the existing entity which he continues to hold i think this is something the some uh, some way in which it can be done so that this can be uh, completed. Second question is that in case of uh, primal DHFL deal, if someone bought from secondary market at 250 and how debenture holders will receive debentures of primal. Sorry, sir, I am not aware about this and I am not very strong on that. Let me skip this question, Neil. Uh, in case of one of the real estate deal to finance builders private limited, uh, finance builder, private limited, and to save in tax, can we opt for debentures at discount and redeemable after four years at premium to cover up our principal? And I think there are two specific questions. I would leave those things. What if CCPS acquired before 1st of April 2017 and converted into equity after on 1 for 2019? Can, can I can claim grandfather benefit? I think it's the same thing because in case of conversion also, they have said provided in section 242 8, that if the new equity is allotted in exchange of either the bonds or the equity shares that I hold, in that situation, my original date of acquisition would be considered. And in that situation, if I can take the benefit in case of an amalgamation or a demerger, I can also use it in respect of that. This brings me to a very interesting question, uh, interesting aspect that, you know, when you are talking about a convertible debentures, Right. Let's take a situation of a fully a compulsorily convertible debentures. Compulsorily convertible debentures for the Indian law till such time it is converted would always be treated as a debt. And when we talk about this uh, in a treaty, especially in case of foreign company, the typical provisions which are in respect of capital gains, the capital gain provisions are divided. And I'm talking about typical, uh, about 90% of the India's treaties. I'm not talking about 10%, which has got slightly at a variance. Like US, UK would be in a variance. You will have Netherlands would be at variance. You will have Singapore, Mauritius could be at variance. You could have uh, some other treaty could be at a variance, but I'm talking about majority of the other. They divide the capital gain transactions into four important parts. One is the transfer of an immobile property where the tax is levied in the jurisdiction in which the immobile property is situated. Then we talk about transfer of a asset of a, uh, a permanent establishment, it would be chargeable to tax in this in the year in the in the jurisdiction where the permanent establishment is situated. Transfer of the shares of a company, the value of which is predominantly derived from the immobile, situ immobile property situated in a particular state, then the trans capital gain respect of those shares are chargeable to tax in the in the jurisdiction where that immobile property is situated. Transfer of the shares of a company would be chargeable to tax in the year other than one which is covered by the immobile property clause will be chargeable to tax in the jurisdiction where the company is incorporated. So these are the four specific questions. There is a residuary clause. And residuary clause says, in case of any other asset, most of the jurisdictions say that in case of any other asset which is not covered by the earlier four provisions would be chargeable to tax in the state in which the transfer or as they use the word alienator is resident. So if I hold a certain asset which does not qualify to be any of these assets, in that situation, it, the tax on that would be payable in case if I'm a resident of Germany, it would be payable only in Germany, not payable in India, even if it asset is situated in India. So similarly, CCD, these compulsorily convertible debentures are actually nothing but equity instrument pending converted. So when such type of instruments are sold, it does not fall under any of the four categories. It falls under the third, last category. And therefore, CCD, in case the jurisdiction is appropriately selected, capital gains on CCDs will not be chargeable to tax in India. 
which is held by a foreign company. I'm not talking about US investors. I'm not talking about UK investors because their capital gains is chargeable to tax as for the laws of the respective states. There are no exemptions or benefits that are available. So this is important that you need to keep it in mind. I had got a slide which you can make a reference. I'll be sharing this uh, presentation with you. That also you can have a look at it. How can individual assets be fair valued because very essence of slump sale is non-assignment. So see, slump sale is where you sell business as a whole. Okay. When you sell business as a whole, does not mean that you can't value the assets. The principle of valuation could be two ways. Now, say, for example, I'm going to buy a business and I'm telling about it that I'm, I'm buying a business which is a loss making company. Right? It's a loss making company. How do I buy a loss making company? I buy a loss making company on the basis of the uh, on the basis of the book values of the respective assets or on the basis of fair value of the assets because the profit does not have. So it's a still a going concern acquisition. It's a still a business that I've inquired. It is not a slump sale. But it's still a buy of an, of an undertaking. So there is the possibility of having an itemized buy, wherein I assign value to individual assets, and having assigned the individual value to those assets, I make an acquisition of a thing. It's a method of determination of valuation. It does not change the character of an undertaking or not an undertaking. So that's what is the uh, answer to Rishi Agarwal's question. I think that completes all my questions. I've completed. I've taken five more minutes. Apologies to my uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Chowdhury, who is going to speak after me. And thank you very much to everyone for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts. I hope you have enjoyed this lecture. Thank you. Back to you, Vivek. Thank, thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it was our pleasure listening to you, sir. And uh, uh, I would request Pusudip uh, Rukta to give a formal vote of thanks to Milan, sir. Kindly unmute. Yeah. Uh, uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, yes, you are audible. Very good evening. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Milan, sir, for the wonderful deliberation. And uh, I would uh, like to thank uh, ACA and all the organizing uh, members, all the people who are behind this, uh, especially Vivek, sir, and uh, Mayur Bia. And uh, sir, during this, uh, Milan, sir, during this pandemic times, uh, we are, uh, since we are unable to meet physically, uh, we are presenting our e-memento as a token of appreciation for the uh, wonderful uh, session that we've had today. Uh, I would like to share it with you, sir, here. Uh, if, you, if someone could please uh, enable my screen sharing, I would. Yes, you can share. Yeah. I hope this is uh, visible, sir. This is a small token of appreciation from our side, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you sir. Uh, Thank now you. I would uh, request uh, Mayuvia to please take over. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we have our second speaker of the day, Advocate Ajay Chaudhary ji. We had his introduction at the inception of the session. So I request you, Ajay sir, to kindly uh, take over and proceed with your deliberation. So uh, with your permission, I'll take your leave because I was under the impression that my, the session is going to end at 30. So I'd call someone who's already come and here and waiting. So I'll take your leave. Ajay ji, all the best to you and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Sir, you are uh, mute, kindly unmute, Ajay, sir. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, sir, you are audible. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting uh, me to speak before you. We are association. Uh, this is the first time I think Mr. Mehta was speaking to you all for the second time as I heard him. He's made a very elaborate and a very detailed and a very lucid discussion. 
and uh, I was also privy to a lot of things that he was talking, and I found what he said to be very informative. Now, the topic which has been given to me is basically the implications of stamp duty on business structuring. Now, before I actually start and dwell on certain finer aspects of stamp duty implications and how one could assess as to what could be the best instrument in a given fact, I would like you all to be introduced to the concept of stand duty. I do not wish to speak or talk or waste anybody's time on discuss as to what is stand duty. Stand duty is leviable by reason of provisions of Indian Stamp Act. Indian Stamp Act is a fiscal legislation and stamp duty is a state subject. Meaning thereby that though we have an Indian Stamp Act, all the states are free to have their own stamp duty acts or rules or even the rates at which a particular instrument would be admitted or chargeable to stamp duty. Similarly, our state, that is West Bengal, also, though following the Indian Stamp Act, has made a separate schedule, which is Schedule 1A, relating to all instruments which will be chargeable to stamp duty and the rate of stamp duty. Before I proceed further, I must admit that I was toying with the idea of having a PPT presentation, as Mr. Mehta did. But I decided against it for a simple reason that stamp duty being a state subject and the implications on business structuring being a, dis being a topic to discuss and to understand need not have a PPT presentation. And thus I'm not going to present any PPT for you all. It is not necessary. Uh, before I go further, I want to clear one small confusion that many people have, that stamp duty is payable only with respect to or in respect of those instruments which are registrable. This is fallacious. Stamp duty is payable even in the simple agreements which we make. When we talk about drawing up an agreement in a non-judicial stamp paper, what we are actually doing is we are subjecting that instrument to stamp duty. Similar in the case of an award, an award passed by an arbitrator is not registrable but it is subjected to stamp duty. In our state, the stamp duty is 150 rupees. I hope you will understand that, uh, that registration has no bearing on stamp duty implication. Registration emanates from the provisions of the Indian Registration Act more specifically section 17 and section 18, which dwells on registrability of a document. Section 17 dwells on which documents are compulsorily registrable and 18 
on those documents which may be optionally registered. Now, insofar as the compulsory registrable documents are concerned, suffice to say it in one line, these would pertain to those documents where one seeks to establish or extinguish a right in an immovable property, value of which should exceed 100 rupees. Any document which, I repeat, any document which pur purports to create, extinguish any right in an immovable property would be compulsory registrable. Now, before I go further, I would wish to tell you one thing, that a document, if inadequately stamped suffers from a pitfall and that pitfall is mentioned in section 35 of the Indian Stamp Act where it makes that document inadmissible in evidence. So please remember a document which is not stamped or adequately stamped does not become null and void, but it only becomes inadmissible in evidence. Now, going back to a document which is registrable, I have already told you that the documents, all documents that tend to create, establish, extinguish a right in an immoral property value of which exceeds 100 rupees, is compulsorily registrable. That is where a deed of conveyance comes in because a deed of conveyance transfers title from one person and vests that title on another. There is transfer of ownership and hence a deed of conveyance is registrable. So would be a lease deed a deed of assignment, a slum sale, a slum sale in respect of a, a undertaking which involves an immoral property, a business transfer agreement, a business transfer agreement which actually transfers a right in an immoral property would be registrable though I have my own reservations, whether a business transfer agreement in relation to sale of a tea estate, whether that is registrable or not, for the simple reason that that business transfer agreement only seeks to transfer a right and not the title, because that would be within the purview of the state government all tea gardens are held as leases. So the lease has to be transferred. It is transferred by the state government and when stamp duty is payable. So in a business transfer agreement concerning a tea estate, it may not be registered as I've done in several cases. I would now very briefly tell you that business structure or business structuring or proposals of business structuring based on stamp duty implication is very novel. I am yet to advise of the clients have yet to come to me saying that how do I structure a particular proposal for transfer depending on the stamp duty implication. For the sim, I would I would like to make it a little more clearer. If a document, or if my agreement with a person is with respect to sale of a property, a transfer of title, it cannot be done by way of a lease. In the lease, the 
title to the property would remain with the owner. It would just that the owner would be transferring certain rights to me, nothing more, not the title. So to that extent, when we discuss as to what is the best way to go about, when we seek to talk about a business proposal, I have yet to come across a situation where we discuss stamp duty. If we have to transfer something, we have to transfer something. If the better way to do it is to take it on lease, it will be taken on lease. I, I do not know any instance where a proposal has undergone a change merely because of a stamp duty implication. I would, in fact, earlier, people were making merry on amalgamations and demergers because these were not per se subjected to or held to be subjected to any stamp duty. This was about 15, 20 years back. However, during that time, there are a couple of pronouncements which came into being. It emanated in a, in a legal proceeding which I, where I was involved before the Calcutta High Court, where I sought to argue and the court agreed that amalgamations are not subjected to any stamp. Any order under the provisions of section 391, as it then was, is not subjected to any stamp duty. The court did hold in my favor. However, the judgment was overruled by the Supreme Court in the Hindustan Unilever case, where the court held that even if the Stamp Duty Act does not specifically provide for any stamp duty, however, the order sanctioning the scheme is an instrument and as an instrument, it is liable for stamp duty at the rate of conveyance. It would be deemed conveyance. Thereafter, the legislator thought it wise, and many of the states have now incorporated va variable rates of stamp duty. Many, uh, all the, as I've told you, stamp duty being a state subject, the state governments are free to fix the stamp duty rates. In West Bengal, in, in case of an amalgamation or a demerger, it is 2% of the market value of the property situated in West Bengal or half percent of the true market value of the shares issued and allotted to the shareholders, whichever is higher. So when you are trying to amalgamate, when you are trying to restructure your business through a demerger, you have to bear in mind that the instrument would be subjected to stamp duty, and this is the rate of stamp duty, 2% or half percent, whichever is higher. 2% of the market value of the property situated in West Bengal or half percent of the value of shares issued and allotted to the shareholders, whichever is more. Now, this is by the way and beside the point that I do not see how our government is seeking to really collect the stamp duty which becomes payable on any amalgamation. I am not understanding how and what they are doing to collect this duty. A lot of orders of amalgamation and demergers are being passed. No stamp duties are being collected. But that is beside the point. I don't think so. We are, uh, we are here to discuss that. Uh, I've just told you by the way. So in the event, the proposal is of an amalgamation. The proposal is to demerge a particular undertaking in favor of another undertaking, then all you need to know is the stamp duty implication in the state which would be sanctioning the scheme. 
it may so happen that a scheme may require sanction of two courts. The question will come, which court's order would be subjected to stamp duty? My answer would be both. However, you would not pay stamp duty on the same instrument or on the same property twice. So meaning thereby, in the event you have been subjected to stamp duty in respect of an inward property by reason of the by reason of the provisions contained in the West Bengal schedule, the portion of duty paid in West Bengal would not be subjected to fresh duty elsewhere. That is how we have done. In fact, uh, that is what was done in one particular case. But as I told you, nobody is there to collect stamp duty in West Bengal. I have not seen how it is collected. But that is beside the point. Now, each instrument, as I told you, is subjected to stamp duty, be it a conveyance, be it an order sanctioning a scheme, be it a lease, be it an assignment, be it a slump sale, be it a business transfer agreement where you transfer a right or title of to a person except in respect of a T state where I said I have reservations because there I'm unable to do so because the leases are held by the state government. So I would, in respect of all these business structuring instruments, the stamp duty implication would really spell out from the state where this structure would take place. If it happens in West Bengal, then you have to see the rates applicable to West Bengal. If it happens elsewhere, you have to see what happens elsewhere. What I've not been able to understand is, as I told you, that I have till date not been advising any client or I have not advised any client who has come to me and said that the, I would only go through a particular proposal if it is if it is stamp duty, if your stamp duty implication is nil or negligible. Taxation implications are different. We are not talking on that, but those are different. I'm only on stamp duty. I am yet to come across or advise a client who has told me that we will go through a business structuring only and only if we understand that there is no stamp duty implication. I am yet to come across a situation of that nature. Stamp duty is payable on all instruments. It is payable on instruments which is registrable or non-registrable. It is payable on anything. It is payable when you when you drop a power attorney. A power, when you drop a power attorney, it does not require registration. The only document where stamp duty is not payable in law is a will. You need not draw up a will in a non-judicial stamp paper. It can be done in a plain paper. In fact, a will can be made in a matchbox. That is the present situation with respect to business structuring. I do not know how do I advise a particular client as to what would be the stamp duty implication and whether the stamp duty implication makes the deal worthwhile or not? A taxation implication may, I, I agree, but not a stamp duty implication. If you have to, if, if, if the business structuring involves that some property has to change hands, it would, it, would, it would be subjected to stamp duty. However, with a small modification which I would like to make, and this is where I would like to put my views across. 
you ought to know that stamp duty on a transfer of an asset is on the basis of schedule 1a however if the transfer is to a near, is to a member of the family it can be transferred at a lower rate on the basis of a gift deed here a, a structuring comes in if it is a family settlement the family settlement can entail two types one to drop a partition deed and subject that partition deed to stamp duty where the stamp duty is almost negligible or to do it by way of a gift where the stamp duty is also substantially low however these are only where you are discussing a plausible family settlement it does not have any implication where you are discussing about a transaction on arms length basis no i am unable to make any comment on how i could advise my client differently merely because the stamp duty implication on a sale of an immoral property could be different if it instead of a sale i advise my client to do a lease today for example if my if i advise my client to do a lease for a long term if in the event the lease is for a period of more than 30 years the same duty as conveyance would be levied why should i tell a client that rather than doing a lease rather than doing a sale you do a lease i will not i will never advise anybody that you do a lease do not take title but try to save a save a couple of lakhs and continue to let the title remain with the lessor while you get substantial rights for a lifetime i will not uh, i my personal belief is that any proposal for business structuring should not partake or cannot partake any implication on stamp duty i am sorry but i i thought that probably many of you all would be thinking that stamp duty could have implications on business structuring but i personally feel it does not if a particular business proposal requires a particular transaction to be con contemplates a particular transaction we ought to do that particular transaction in that way only and make it a complete structure rather than doing it incompletely and inadequately i i would not want to talk too much on this subject because for me what is more important is for you all to understand what is stamp duty how stamp duty is payable which are the documents which are registrable which are not what happens if you inadequately or don't stamp a document these are issues which are more germane and important but not an implication on stamp duty if 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 today you were to propose a demerger will you not do the demerger merely because the stamp because of stamp duty implication i don't think so there may be cases where may this there where people may say that well because of the implication i am not going to go through this demerger but that is that that has no bearing on the structuring it is either you go with it or you don't go with it if you go with it you go with it and do that exact transaction which is contemplated 
rather than trying to do something else, merely because you could save something on stamp duty. You will not. You will end up with a transaction which would not suffice. I, I do not know what much or how much to say on this topic really. Uh, and I would end by thanking the association for having invited me. I'm sorry because my discourse has been short, but I didn't really want to talk on issues which are not a part of my discussion today. And I do not want you all to feel, because that is how I feel, and that is what I've told you all. I do not feel any business structuring, the implication of stand duty can or should have a bearing. Thank you very much. Thank you Thank very much. If there be Thank any you. questions, I'm willing to take those questions. Uh, I'm willing to take those questions if there be any questions from anybody. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, it was very short and crisp. Uh, we have got an idea regarding the implications of stamp duty in restructuring. We have a question in the chat box, sir. Mr. Paris is asking uh, whether stamp duty is payable on immoral property owned by private limited companies, which is converted into LLP to make a LLP the owner of the said property. Uh, as I told you, stamp duty would be payable the moment there is any transfer of title, any instrument purporting to transfer a title from one entity, entity to another, be it individual, be it an association, be it a private limited company to an LLP, it would be subjected to stamp duty. With this, uh, the question was regarding the transaction when uh, LLP is converted into a, a company is converted into an LLP. A, and that... a, uh, yes, I was also coming on that. If a company, if there is a conversion of a company into an LLP, that particular con conver conversion does not entail in, does not entail any payment of stand duty because it is converted in pursuant to provisions of the companies that or the LLP Act and it, those stamp duty would be payable in respect of that particular transaction where there is conversion. Uh, I would uh, request uh, the delegates if you have any questions you can write in the chat box or you can raise your hands so that we can allow you to ask the question to the soul. So if you could if you could highlight the stamp duty implications on these shares transfer of share which the uh, last year it has been amended and uh, it has been streamlined throughout the country because previously there were separate uh, stamp duties so if you can highlight a bit on that sir uh, transfer of shares now transfer of shares everybody knows and that securities shares are held in DMAC form there is no stamp duty implication at all. Mm -hmm. In respect of all limited companies, all limited companies now are mandatorily required to have or, or hold all their shares in demand. Mm -hmm. And so far as the transfer in relation to any shares of a private limited company is concerned, mm -hmm. the stamp duty implication is really negligible for people to really contemplate whether it should be done or not. As I told you, I, in mm -hmm. my view, stamp duty there is no implication of stamp duty on a business structuring. It, there cannot be a taxation, I understand, but stamp duty implication cannot be. I'm yet to advise the client on that. I have advised clients on, uh, on taxation aspects, yes, I agree, but not on stamp duty. Uh, we have uh, one or two questions in the chat box, sir. I'll read it for you. Uh, yeah, please do. See, Dilip is asking whether stamp duty is attracted when immoral property is released on family settlement. It is difficult sometimes to make understand uh, 
to sub registrar that stamp duty is not attracted uh, if you can uh, quote any court judgment or something like that that would be uh, the, uh, i'll tell you family partition family settlements are a very complex branch of law and the judgments are are, are too many for comfort all said and done a release is cannot or does not uh, on the basis of a family settlement is not subjected to stamp duty but the registrar don't understand this i'll i'll tell you i'll tell you i'll give you a small example yesterday i did a gift i did a i did the registration of a gift of a of, of whether father mother and the elder brother and the younger brother gifted their undivided right title interest in a property to their another brother normally in case of a gift to a near to a family member the rate of stamp duty in west bengal is half percent as compared to the uh, implication of stamp duty that is 7% on a sale however as that gift purported to only assign a right and not because the person who was gifting the right had received that right on assignment and not on sale the entire document that is the gift deed was subjected to full stamp duty which my client reluctantly agreed to pay and i had to pay full stamp duty of course the document was registered yesterday similarly in case or in the instant case though a release deed uh, on the basis of a family settlement should not normally be subjected to stamp duty however the registrar are not and i i'll tell you i can give you three four judgments i don't want to put it before here because there are there are conflicting judgments and this issue has yet to be settled finally by the supreme court we are hoping that this issue would be settled thank you so much sir a counter question is there related to the same issue from mr parees he is asking uh, whether it is at all necessary in case of a family settlement to get the name changed in the title deeds or we can continue with the first while name uh in the in the event of a title document uh where a family settlement has taken place normally the same document because of, as i told you a partition deed a family settlement should be registered the stamp duty is minimal in the event i receive a particular property in 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 lieu of a family settlement and the family settlement itself is registered then there is no need for any change in the name of the owner because my ownership would emanate from the original doc- title document and the family settlement registered family settlement and the only ministerial act which i ought to do in that case is have my name mutated as the owner before the municipal authorities nothing more it is not required thank you sir and uh, uh, a question from mr paris is there two companies having same shareholders and they are holding uh, shares in the same ratio in both the companies in this case if there is a merger of these two companies is there any stamp duty concession for removal properties owned by the these companies getting transferred firstly uh, if there is cross holding if there be any if there be if there be uh, I, i suppose you are not talking about cross holding no, no sir you are talking about uh, for that both, same set of shareholders correct. Yeah, that both the companies would have same set of shareholders yes sir 
there would be no remission. So you are telling there will be no implication uh, of stamp duty will not be required to pay. There, uh, there would be no remission. Stamp duty okay. will still be paid. Still be applicable. Yes. Okay. Because the stamp duty, the the uh, as far okay. as our state is concerned, it does not make uh, it does not make any concession in, in such a given case. There used to be a notification which was prevalent in 1937 where such an instrument could qualify for remission, but no longer. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have one last question from Mr. Paris. Uh, he's asking whether in case of conversion of company into LLP, is there a requirement of getting the title D changed in the name of the LLP? Uh, change in the name of a title document is a complex procedure. It is not required. It is not required at all. It is not required in law. And the title document would continue to be valid and it will confer you full ownership rights. No change in no change in name is required or mandated in law. Ajiji has raised hand. Ajiji, you can unmute and ask the question. Sir, in, in, in a HUF, the all co personal relinquish their right in favor of the karta, and there is an immovable property. Does it require registration in the name of the karta? And whether it will attract any stamp duty liability? Uh, when you say ask this question, then mm -hmm. I assume that the HUF is being dissolved. Okay, uh, yes, there is a full party, sir. It, yeah. No, that then it will it will be a different. If there is a court partition, it has a different uh, connotation. In a court partition, the partition deed, the deed of partition, the order of court, that is what is required to be registered. Okay. No, but no, no separate document requires to be registered at all. Okay. If it is a court, if it is the, a court, there are two a court proceeding part. induced partition. Is it, is it a requirement that I should uh, get it registered in the court if there is a partition? If it is no, it, there is no requirement for registering any document in a court. But mm -hmm. I, all I am saying is that if the, if the partition has happened by reason of a court pronouncement, Okay. Then that order of court ought to be registered. And that okay. is the only document which ought to be registered. No other title document requires registration. It will confer valid, good, marketable title. If the partition is executed through a written agreement amongst the compartner and karta, still it is required to uh, file it. Uh, before the in court, the event, in the event any court document, any document, if a court partition is not mandated or not okay. involved, then in that case, if the co-partners are giving away the property to the karta, then okay. they need to execute a deed of relinquishment. Okay, a deed of relinquishment where they relinquish their, their share in the property in favor mm -hmm. of the karta. A deed of okay. relinquishment, again in law, requires okay. registration. Yes, yes, and, yes. And in my view, in, a, in the case which you've just spoken about, a yeah. deed of relinquishment is the best document to execute, and it would be advisable if such document is registered. Okay, sir. Sir, one more question. If there is a LLP, there are two designated partners. One partner get retired and got his money in full. And there is a one property in LLP. Now, what will be the fate of that property? Whether it needs a registration in the name of the continuing digit, uh, partner or uh, it, uh, it will continue as it is? Uh, uh, limited liability part partnership. Unlike a yes, partnership it, under the Indian Partnership Act, 
can hold inverse properties in its own name. Okay. In the event, in the given case, the property is registered in the name of the LLP. That is it. It continues to be registered in the name of the LLP. One designated partner gets goes out, and probably the 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 continuing designated partner would induct somebody else, and thereafter they they will enter into a fresh LLP agreement and carry on business. I do no, not say, I do not see this transaction requiring any registration. No, no, sir. The continuing partner want to dissolve the firm now. He doesn't want to continue the LLP. This is the situation. In, in the, the event, surviving partner. In the event he wants to dissolve the firm, the yeah. LLP, then then the property, if the property is in the name of the LLP, if yeah. the property is in the name of the LLP, mm. then I I would suggest that what he should do is he should incorporate. A company, a limited company. No, sir. He doesn't want. He want to dissolve. I, I'm just. If he wants to dissolve, then what? What happens to a title? Title of the LLP. The title to that property. Title yeah. cannot. Title cannot remain in thin air. It has to vest with somebody. So, if okay. the title to the LLP. Uh, uh, it, it cannot remain in thin as you dissolve uh, and dissolve it by doing what? What do you do with that immoral property? If you want to take over that immoral property, uh, if you want to dissolve, that is the reason. In this case, my advice would be that what you should do is you should incorporate a limited company with the object of taking over the assets and business of the LLP. And th by this, you would avoid you would avoid registration and possible stamp duty. No, sir. If I suppose I want to get it registered in the name of the designated partner and want to dissolve the LLP in total, in, so the, is event it you want, in the event you want the property to be transferred by LLP in the name of the designated partner, it would yeah. tantamount to transfer of title. Yeah. And and consequently, such a document may be subjected, uh, would require registration and consequential payment of stamp duty. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have a question from CA Dilip, sir. In case of transfer of temple to a trust, whether stamp duty is leviable when the same is... Uh, same is settled as trust property. Hello. Can can you repeat the question? I think there was some disturbance somewhere. Ah, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. In case in case of transfer of temple to a trust, whether stamp duty is leviable, uh, when the the same is settled as trust property. Uh, in the event a property is settled as a trust property, uh, this document, uh, if, the, if it is a trust deed, is registrable. But if you transfer a temple that is a, a immoral property to a trust, it would be by way. I if you set if. You see, I like to make it this way because you have uh, you've not clarified your question or the situation. First is, if you settle a temple into a trust, then in that case, stamp duty implication will be almost negligible. The trust deed would require registration and the stamp duty would be almost negligible and the temple would deemed to have been settled in the trust and would become a trust property. However, if there is a trust which is in existence and if you wish to transfer the temple to that trust, then it can be done by way of a donation. If you do it by way of a donation, then the, uh, there is registration is necessary. 
However, the stamp duty implication would be negligible. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, one more question from Mr. Pares. Property is purchased by company. The director who signed property per, uh, is now retired. If this property is sold after the retirement of the director who signed the purchase this originally, whether his signature will be required at the time of selling of property? Uh, the title holder is the company. Correct. The company can uh, and the directors may come and go. Uh, it would not require the signature of the person who had ordinarily signed the document. It will not, it cannot. Because the company could hold the, doc, uh, the property for 50 years. A person may not be there. So, no, it is not required. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, sir, you have in detail answered all the queries. I don't think there are any queries left. So thank you so much on behalf of ACE, sir. I request uh, CA Pushpadeep Runta to kindly give a formal vote of thanks to a second speaker of the day and offer a memento on behalf of ACE. Uh, good evening, Ajay, sir. Uh, I would really like to thank you for such a pleasant session, for an enlightening session today. Uh, here is a e memento from our side as a token of appreciation i hope this is visible sir yeah thank you very much thank you very much for the appreciation and the honor thank you very much it's been an absolute pleasure to uh, talk on uh, a particular subject uh, and uh, it's an it's been an absolute pleasure thank you very much thank you all for listening and thank pleasure. you all Absolutely, ours, sir. Thank you. Uh, I Thank would you hand over. The, I would hand over the proceedings to uh, Mayur Bhia. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, thank you all the delegates once again. And uh, a reminder rega regarding the last day of this wonderful workshop. Tomorrow again we will be meeting from four four thirty p.m. We are having uh, two speaker, uh, C. A. Amrit Raj sir and C. A. V. Raguraman sir will be uh, talking mainly on, uh, uh, the first speaker will be talking on structuring of st startups and the second speaker, Raguraman sir, would be speaking on GST implications on business restructuring. So looking forward to meet all of you tomorrow. Thank you all.